All right. Good morning uh, to the 151st uh, and the 136th Chaplain Detachment. Um, welcome to your post two yellow ribbon event. Um, right now, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Colonel McAuliffe, and he would like to uh, say a few words for you, uh, to you, uh, sir. Go ahead. Can you hear me okay, Ken? I think I'm on video too as well, right? Uh, I can hear you. Um, okay, let me try to get this I going I can here. see you. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, Ken. And uh, I would like to thank the uh, organiz organizers of the Yellow Ribbon event uh, for allowing me the opportunity to speak to the, the soldiers of the second of the 151. You know, I'll try to keep my comments short because you guys have a long day ahead of you. Uh, but to Captain Jones and the soldiers of the second of the 151, you all did an outstanding job, uh, and we're extremely proud of you. The, the performance that you guys had on the Southwest border uh, mission was impressive, uh, to say the least. Uh, you guys dealt with adversity. Uh, you had a long train up. You had some last minute changes to the sector in which you guys uh, were going to do operations after the parent organization uh, had an incident. Uh, they put you guys uh, in the toughest sectors, and there was never any doubt about your guys' capabilities. All the uh, word back from the chain of command uh, while you guys were deployed was was nothing less than just uh, laudatory co comments about your guys' abilities. Um, you guys flew in an extremely dangerous and unforgiving environment, as you know. Um, nothing tougher than being uh, along a border area, especially low illumination in a desert environment. Uh, but you did so exceptionally well. Uh, you guys flew over 1,670 hours, uh, which was composed of 373 flights, 77 911 calls, and 47 subjects rescued, um, while all while operating out of two different locations in Tucson and El Paso. That prevents a unique challenge, as you guys know, to any maintenance and mission command uh, operation. So, again, extremely impressive uh, performance by you all along the border. Uh, the chain of command is proud of you. Uh, Colonel Harper asked me to pass along uh, my congratulations to you and a job well done, as well as up to the chain of command to the Joint Force Headquarters. As you all know, I have a special place in my heart for the SNS. Uh, grew up there initially in the Guard um, with uh, some of the folks that are still in your organization and some that have uh, moved on to other operational uh, units or retired. So, thank you again for your all's commitment uh, to the organization. Uh, to the people of North Carolina and to the people of the United States, uh, just an extremely uh, well uh, job well done by you all. Uh, I would like to tell you all that you know as you go through this yellow ribbon event, uh, a lot of you have been deployed before, um, myself included, and our tendency is to kind of just play at lift service or not pay attention. You know, I, I would say that every one of them is different, and things change uh, as far as resources and also information that may be important to you and your family. You know, I would also uh, point out that, you know, each time you come home, you're faced with different challenges. Uh, I know personally, I, I had two deployments while I've been married, and the first one was a lot easier. Uh, second one, not so much. Um, you know, that reintegration as the kids get older, um, and perhaps the spouse gets less uh, understanding of the time you've been uh, gone. So, again, you know, Please take out of this what you can. Uh, pay it. Uh, pay attention to what the information is, and and use the resources available to you. Um, and as I tell uh, my soldiers every week in a drill, you know these are some uh, really challenging times with COVID, with the economy, uh, with the job market, and other variables. Uh, please, if you if if anyone needs help, you know if you're struggling, um, make sure you reach out to the chain of command or the behavioral health folks up at the Joint Force Headquarters, and we'll do everything to help you all out and uh, get through whatever situation you're in. So again, Captain Jones and the soldiers of the 2nd of 151, just an outstanding job, and, and it's an honor to be your uh, battalion commander. Ken, that's all that I have. Thank you, sir. Uh, appreciate that. Sergeant Hill, if you wanna go down the schedule for today. So our agenda today, we're going to do the opening, and I'll do a TAA brief. Ms. Janine Johnson is going to do, do you hear what I mean? 
Next, we'll have TRICARE, VA, and VHA. We'll have a USAA brief, Military One Source, a finance brief with the PFC for North Carolina. Uh, IG would like to talk to you guys for a second and make sure that you have their contact information. We have an education brief with multiple colleges. We have a SARC chart brief. Wounded Warrior and Lone Survivor Foundation are going to hop on and tell you about their organizations and what they can provide. We have an IBHS brief, reintegration in the age of COVID. Chaplain Waters is going to talk, and then we'll close it out at around 1.30 to 1.45. Mr. Matt DeVivo asked me to pass along his information. He is the Transition Assistant Advisor for North, the North Carolina National Guard. He is a one-stop shop for all state benefits, physical well-being, health insurance, legal assistance. He can answer basically any question that you have. And his contact information is 202-987-3913-31. And his email address is on top. If you need assistance, you can scan this QR code, enter this information, and he'll get back to you within uh, 24 to 72 oh. hours. Again, he is any information that you need for North Carolina, all your benefits. The North Carolina Legal, Legal Assistance Program is doing free preparation of your federal and state tax returns. This is at no charge to you. They're doing it at Joint Force Headquarters. All you have to do is make an appointment you, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday between 0930, 09 and 0930. You drop your documents off. And then before noon, your taxes are probably done and you come pick them up. This is at no charge to you. All you have to do is make an appointment. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Janine Johnson for Do You Hear What I Mean? All right. Thank you, Brian. Am I going to use my share my screen? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to stop sharing in a second. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'll be listening to your comments. Uh, via Facebook, so I know there's a little lag time between what we're doing on WebEx and uh, what comes up on Facebook. So if there's a little pause there, it's because I'm waiting to see and look for uh, comments on Facebook. So again, good morning, uh, welcome, welcome back. I know I was with you um, last, um, last month and um, start my video here. So many things to do at once. All right, there you are. Um, again, it's great to be back with you. Uh, we're going to talk about communication today uh, and how uh, just communication in general and communication uh, when it comes to reintegration. And um, there's uh, uh, lots of stuff that uh, goes on with communication. So this is what we're going to be doing today is talking about what communication is, uh, how we can communicate effectively. We're going to look at you and I statements and uh, understand the difference between complaints and criticism and talk about how we can listen effectively. And again, I like this to be uh, an interactive class. So I will be monitoring the, um, the comments. And um, so as we get started here, uh, what do you think communication is when people say, can you define communication? What would you say uh, what communication is to you? You can just type a couple comments in uh, Facebook. That would be great. Um, communications is a lot of things in it. Uh, as you know, trying to reintegrate back into uh, your family life, into your work life, into just life in general after your deployment, that um, communication might be a problem. Uh, my husband and I, were uh, next month we'll be married 33 years and we're still trying to 
figure out how to communicate with each other. He um, did 30 years of active duty. And so uh, during that time, I learned how to speak uh, military language. And I worked with the military also. So uh, as you know, any family members on, and even if you're new to the military yourself, that the military has its own language. And sometimes communication can get mixed up if you're not using the same words as each other and or if you don't know the meaning of those words or the context of those words so communication is an exchange of information between individuals and nowadays that's using symbols that's using signs that's using behaviors we have so many ways to communicate nowadays it's just not uh what it used to be like the written word and the and the um spoken word. There's so many other emojis out there, if you would, uh, of uh, how you can communicate. So, in, in ex exchanging, communications is exchanging a message back and forth uh, between uh, two people. And I see on the comments that, uh, good morning, Mr. Josh White. It's nice to have you back. Uh, you say uh, two-way communication shared between individuals. Exactly correct. That's uh, one of the facets of communication. And, um, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, another person said communication is difficult. That's exactly true. And uh, sometimes with the more ways we have to communicate, it makes it uh, even uh, more difficult to do so. And as we have to remember, as we communicate that uh, our communication contains both content uh, and feeling. Um, and so there's this, like I said, a lot of things that are is wrapped up in uh, communication in general. But um, the snake next statement that I've, I've put up here, I want you to think about it. Is this true or false? The message sent is not always message received. Well, would you agree with that? That the message sent is not always the message received. Um, <clears throat> and um, I know in my situation, I really have to uh, think about, depending on who I'm talking to, especially my husband, uh, that what is the message that I want to get? And uh, a lot of you are saying, yes, true, that it, that's true, that the message sent is not always the message received. So uh, again, we have to think about how we communicate, and then we think, have to think about what message we're sending and how the other person's going to receive it, because there's all kinds of things that go on in communication uh, that makes uh, maybe that message being received difficult. It could be cultural background. It could be a language barrier. It could be experience barrier that the person that you're talking to doesn't necessarily have the same uh, uh, experience level that you do. So we have to keep all of that in mind when it comes to communication. Um, so this next statement that I put up there, put up here, I want you to think about it also. Is it, it, it says it is impossible not to communicate. Again, I'd like to see, um, uh, what you think about that? Uh, that it is that true or false? It is impossible not to communicate. Um, someone put in the comments that uh, there can be a misunderstanding, especially when it comes to the written word or text message, and that's exactly true. A lot of times, you know, I'm old. I'm old, and I'm old-fashioned. That it's just easier for me to pick up my phone and call my children and talk to them and they'll say mom why don't you just text it's be, well number one i'm a terrible texter number two i want to make sure but that my message my content and feeling is being received uh so i have uh on the comments that someone said yes it is true it is it is impossible not to communicate and people say well what if i'm just sitting there not saying anything well that in itself is a form of communication because if someone's talking to you um that uh, maybe you're not listening, uh, you know, an active listening, um, that you want to nod, you want to do some, give them some kind of indication that, yes, you are listening, that you are uh, listening to them, you are hearing what they're saying, you are receiving their message. So if you're just sitting there doing nothing or sitting there uh, on your phone or whatever, it, you, you are communicating something. OK, so keep that in mind also that whatever you do, um, you are communicating. So next, I'm going to show you a video to where it kind of uh, is an example of the message sent is not always the message received. 
um, again, this is an example of message sent is not always a message received. Uh, so the first part of this video doesn't have any sound, and then the sound will come up. Now, I want to find the color. As long as it's okay with the audience. I'm crazy about baseball. Will you stand still? Pick up your hat. Go pick up your hat. Now, look. And you'll go and peddle your popcorn and don't interrupt the act anymore? Yes, sir. All right. But you know, strange may seem they give ball players nowadays very peculiar names. Funny names, nicknames, pet not, names. Not as funny as my name, Sebastian Dinwiddie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Funny and Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellows' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellows' name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yeah. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Who's on the first base without first surgery? Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first base for every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. Why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yeah. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's white? Yes. But for all the man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. Well, I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no. What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm not going to change your nobody. Take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? Who's playing first? Stay off of first, will you? Well, what do you want me to do? Now, what's the guy's name on third base? What's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. Well, I can't change their names. Will you please stay on third base, Mr. Broadhurst? Now, what is it you want to know? What is the fellow's name on third base? What is the fellow's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. You got an outfield? Oh, sure. Thank you. So again, this is uh, an example of uh, message sent is not message received, and that's old Abbott and Costello. Some of you have may have heard of them. Some of you may have not. Some of you have may have seen this uh, video again. I like to show it. Uh, because it's funny, and number two, it's a prime example of using different language, uh, different experiences that they, uh, the message sent is not the message received uh, because of a lot of things. So um, next, we're going to talk about the components of communication. A lot of um, uh, people think uh, the um, food for thought out there that there's three components of of communication. So, um, what do you think the three components of communication is? Uh, three, they're kind of three big uh, things that you can put under the uh, heading of communication, and it's part of communication. And some of you said it uh, when I asked you the definition of communication. Um, so, if you can just put in the comments, what do you think the three components of uh, communication are? All right, uh, the word, someone said it in the definition of communication that uh, uh, when it comes to miscommunication, it's because maybe uh, a text or uh, email or something was sent in the written word that um, was misunderstood. So words are those first uh, part of communication, no matter if it's written or it, if it's spoken. The second part is uh, the voice quality of communication. It's your voice. Is it monotone? Uh, does it is it loud? Is it angry? Is it uh, it can be a, a lot of different things. Um, uh, during our time in the military, we, we always lived in quarters, and the last set of quarters that we lived in was four stories. So we had two main living stories. We had a basement, and we had uh, an attic, and we had back stairs. And so the kitchen was uh, close to the back stairs. So whenever it was dinner time, I would gel up. Um, the stairs and say, it's time to eat. 
And finally, after about six months of that, my children said, mom, at dinner time, why are you always so angry? And I'm saying, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not angry. And I, I said, what do you mean? They said, when you yell up the stairs that um, it's time to eat, you sound angry because you, you know, you're just yelling up the stairs. And I said, no, well, yeah, I'm yelling because the house is so big. I want to make sure that you hear me. It's not that I'm angry. So the, they went by the quality of my voice as to kind of what mood I was in. Um, and then the, the last one is body language. And uh, someone said, uh, even if you're just sitting in silence, uh, that you're communicating. And our body language is what gives us away uh, when we're communicating because people can tell if we're listening or not, especially this day and age. Are you looking down at your phone? Are you? Um, uh, are your hands crossed? Are you um, rolling your eyes? Anybody have a teenager, have teenagers, and you're talking to them and they're rolling their eyes. Uh, so that's all part of body language uh, when it comes to communication. So when you put all those three together, that's that total package of uh, a message being sent when you're communicating. So you have to make sure that your words and your voice quality and your body language, all three match up so that you're sending the correct message uh, to the person that you uh, want to receive it so that it's being uh, received in the proper manner, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, keep adding comments to the uh, Facebook if you uh, have questions or want to comment on anything I've sa said. I'm trying to keep up with those. Okay, so these are the three parts of communication. So, um, all of that together is communication. So all of these three parts put together, let's say they equal 100%. So I would like you to put a percentage uh, in uh, on words. What percentage do you think words are when it comes to communication? What percentage of the voice quality do you think makes up communication? And what percentage of body language uh, do you think uh, takes up uh is part of the communication. So in your comments, you can just put words, whatever percent you think words are, voice quality, whatever percent you think that is, body language, whatever you uh, think that is, but totaled together, those three components would act, uh, add up to 100%. So uh, you can go ahead and um, <clears throat> add those to your comments if you like. Uh, so we're looking at the three parts of communication or com components of communication and what percentage of those three um, do you believe are part of communication? Okay, I'm refreshing my comments. So I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, all right. So words are actually only 7% of the communication that you're trying to communicate. So the words that we're saying is only 7% of the message. So keep that in mind. Uh, voice quality. Voice quality is only 38% of the message. Not only, that's a pretty big percentage. So words are 7%, voice quality is 38%. And so that makes body language 55% of the message. That's a pretty big percentage. So just think about it. You're, you're sitting there uh, doing whatever you're doing with your body language, hands folded across your body, uh, eyes rolling, uh, whatever it is, that's 55% of your message. So your body language has to match up with your words and your voice quality, because those little words are only 7% of the message. And we think, wow, I'm, you know, I'm giving, you know, just me today that um, in my message and what I'm saying, those words are only making up 7% of my communication or what I'm trying to communicate to you, my message that I'm sending to you. So we have to remember that. And I have to remember that so that whatever words I say, they have to uh, have an impact on my message. So my message gets across to you, the receiver, uh, so that you we can have um, 
that two way communication that the message I'm sending is the message you're receiving. So I want you to keep that in mind when you're communicating, no matter if it's just day to day communication as you're trying to integrate back into um, your family situation, your work situation, school situation, maybe that as you're trying to communicate, remember that uh, these components have um, a big effect on the message is coming across. And again, depending on who um, you're communicating and uh, the relationship you have with them, we all communicate a little bit differently uh, to those that um, um, are in, that we communicate, because we communicate a little bit different with our family than we do with friends or that we do with very new acquaintances or that we do with somebody that we don't know at all and we're just meeting for the first time. And we have to remember that in that whole communication package, uh, those words, that voice, the body language, both contains content and feeling, because that's the whole package of communication. All right, so um, we're gonna move on and we're gonna do a self-reflection, uh, reflective or reflective exercise. Um, and so it says self, so you're doing it for yourself. And um, here are the instructions. Um, I don't know if you've downloaded any of the information from um, the website that uh, Sergeant Hill gave to you or not. If not, I'm gonna have it up on the screen. So don't worry about it. But these are the exercise, this is the exercise instructions. Okay, you're gonna do it as an individual. So if there's uh, the service member and family members watching, do it each for yourself. Uh, think about how skilled you are and how comfortable you feel about handling each of the situations that's going to be on the next slide. And then I want you to rate each questions from two different viewpoints or two different perspectives that um, I want you to do it as a friend and as a date or a romantic relationship or, you know, if you have a wife, significant other, spouse, uh, whatever. And so that will be on the next page. And this is how... Um, uh, this is how you're going to rate it, okay? And these slides will all be, in, in, all this information is on the next slide. So as you're reading these statements uh, that I'm going to give you, um, rate yourself as either poor, that you're really uncomfortable with it, unable to handle it situation and would avoid it if possible, that is poor. Fair is you feel uncomfortable, but uh, and you have lots of difficulty with the situation, but uh, you're gonna do it, okay? And then okay is somewhat uncomfortable, have difficult handling the situation, but again, uh, you're okay with it, you're gonna, you're gonna do um, or what is in the questions coming up. And then uh, number four is good. If you're good at, you feel quite comfortable and you can handle the situation and extremely good is of course you're very comfortable and um, can handle the situation very well. So you're gonna rate yourself poor, fair, okay, good, or extremely good at um, the exercise. And this is the exercise here. These, here's, um, let's see if I can move my self there so you can see the whole word and the whole situation. Okay, so here's the, here's the exercise. And you can, um, if you wanna do this again later on, you can go to no. the, the uh, the live link is not available on the Facebook page anymore. Um, people were messaging me telling me they can't they can't see it when they go to the page. Uh, this is or Captain Jones. Okay, thank you, Captain Jones. Uh, I'm following along on Facebook. I haven't lost my feed, so I don't know if maybe they need to refresh their screen. Uh, Sergeant Hill or um, Sergeant Martinson. Yeah, I'm I'm following along on Facebook as well. I'll try to pull it up fresh again and see what happens. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to continue on. I'm, I apologize for those that um, uh, maybe have lost the feed. It is up on Facebook for a while, so you can go back and get what you've missed if you've missed some. So back to the reflective exercise. Um, so these are the five questions you're going to ask yourself. And again, you can see off to the left that you, you're going to answer it as a friend and as in a relationship or a, a date, okay? So number one is introducing yourself to someone you might like to get to know. 
Uh, and I know you can all read, so I'm not going to read all of the questions for you. I am going to give you time to do it. So, even if you don't have these questions in front of you, hopefully you have a pencil and paper. Um, if not, you can do it in your mind. And then I'm still going to ask for, um, uh, uh, answers to the questions. So, um, let's see, I'm looking at my feed also. Okay. So, uh, again, answering these 5 questions as poor. Fair, okay, good, or extremely good. This is how you would be in this situation when dealing with a friend or a um, or a uh, in a relationship or a date. So, in general, communication here is, uh, like we said, um, A lot going on with communication. We have our words, we have our voice, we have our uh, body language, mannerisms, all wrapped in uh, everything that we're trying to get ready to, uh, to say, the message that we want to send. And I don't know, a lot of you might have heard about the you and I statements. It's That's how we communicate. Uh, we can either communicate with a you statement or an I statement. And this is usually when you want to talk to somebody about um, uh, well, a lot of things, uh, you statements. So, uh, I'm just going to use my husband and I as, as a uh, example that, um, I could say, would you, uh, do something or you, uh, whatever. And, um, uh, whatever's after the, you can be sometimes perceived as harsh, harsh or aggressive, uh, or attacking, you know, or say, you never listen to me, or you never hear what I say. Um, so it, it, they take it personally and they feel like they're being attacked. So a lot of times a better way of, instead of saying you, you can do I statements and that message focuses on how I feel or how the person that's talking feel the speaker's feelings about a specific behavior. And, uh, it's less attacking and you're, it doesn't seem like you're trying to blame another person. So, um, it's, it's really. When you use an I statement, it's I feel something. It's that emotion that you feel when an action is taking place, and then you want to tell them why. Um, so again, we're going to put this in an example, and I use this all the time. And after 33 years, like I said, with my husband, um, we're still working on these you and I statements. And uh, you, re I really have to catch myself how I'm doing it. It, because it depends on the reaction that I'm getting from him. It's like, I have to think back in my mind, how did I phrase that? Did I phrase it wrong? Did I use the wrong words? Did I use the wrong body language? Did I use, you know, the right voice? So this is a you statement. You are not listening to what I'm saying. You know, we usually say this statement after we've maybe uh, explained the situation, talked about our day or whatever, and we're not getting an answer or we're not getting a response that would go with what we said. It's like, you are not listening to what I'm saying, you know, and, and immediately that person that you're saying that to is going to say, whoa, what do you mean? I'm not listening. So if you would phrase that in an I statement, again, the emotion, action, and the why. So if I would rephrase that instead of saying, you are not listening to what I'm saying. I can say, I feel frustrated when I have to repeat the same information multiple times because it seems as though no one's listening. So it's not as aggressive and telling them that I'm frustrated and why that I'm, that's that emotion. Why am I frustrated? Because the action, that action is I have to repeat myself multiple times. And then the why, because it seems like no one is listening. Uh, and so uh, in a normal live face-to-face uh, -face, uh, yellow ribbon, I would have you practice, write down some uh, I and you statements. But this is very important if you want to take a picture of the screen or whatever works for you uh, to uh, to remember that. Um, I'm going the wrong direction with these. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> that uh, if you're not getting the response or you get an aggressive response or that did you use a you statement or did you use an I statement? Um, so you always want to stay within that I statement of the emotion, 
that you're feeling that I feel that emotion, action, and the why. Okay, so along with the you and I statements, uh, a lot of times um, I know with my husband, he uh, thinks that I'm either uh, that I'm very judgmental, that I'm criticizing, whatever. And so uh, we have to remember that there is a difference between criticism and complaint when we talk. Uh, again, that criticism attacks the person's character or kind of is attacking. And uh, a complaint attacks, um, um, oh, that says the same thing, doesn't it? You can tell I changed my slides at the last minute. Um, so, um, the, um, the complaint should say, should say focuses on a specific behavior. So this is where I can tell if you're paying attention or not, um, that, uh, the, uh, the complaint should say, uh, focuses on a specific behavior. Okay. So the criticism is the you statement. That's when it attacks the character of the, of the person when they feel like they're being attacked. Okay. And so, um, the complaint I have com incorrect. I, I, I do see that the complaint should say attacks. Uh, I mean, the complaint focuses on a specific behavior. It focuses on a specific behavior and that is the I statement. So you want to, to, again, your statement, you want to say a complaint because it focuses on a specific, um, uh, situation. So again, go back to my um, example of I feel like no one's listening to me um, because I have to. Re I feel like no one's listening to me because I have to re uh, repeat myself multiple times. So that's the situation of no one's listening, not that the character of the individual. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> All right. So. Um, Along with uh, the words and the voice and the body language, and depending on how we communicate, is it uh, through symbols, through words, written words, through spoken words, um, <clears throat> we're, we're the ones uh, in the situation of that we're speaking and someone is, we're speaking to someone. So that someone sometimes is you, uh, if you're someone speaking to you that, um, we have to be in an active listening situation because uh, if we're not in an active situ listening situation, um, we don't necessarily get the whole message that's sent. So part of active listening is um, uh, restating maybe of what the person has said, that they understand that, you, uh, that you're getting the message. So if they said, well, um, I don't understand something, you say, listen and then you come back. Uh, what I hear you say is that you don't understand the instructions that I just gave you. Can you can you explain to me what part you don't understand? That way they know that uh, the person that's telling you that and you're listening, they understand that you're getting uh, what they're saying, okay? So um, <clears throat> a lot of times when someone is talking to us, we're not active listening we're formulating what we're going to say to them in uh, in our mind so that we can, can immediately answer them. And that's not what active listening is. Active listening is listening to what they say because we're not mind readers. We might be formulating a message up here uh, to, to give them back that has nothing to do with what they're talking about. So, um, so that's why active listening is very important, that it leads the uh, person that is talking or sending the message that they're being understood. So that's where that two-way communication comes in. Someone speaks, someone's listening, and to make sure that the listener um, is listening and can tell the speaker what uh, that they understand is they can ask questions or clarify or restate what they're saying. Um, so um, again, it it's, uh, sounds simple, it's got a whole bunch of uh, different things going on um, in, um, in that uh, communicating. So just remember that uh, not only are the words and the voice and the um, 
body language important that we have to listen. That's why if you've probably heard a million times, that's why we have one mouth and two ears because we have to hear a listen twice as much as we talk um, to uh, really understand what people are saying. Okay, uh, I have to apologize because I have not been able to get back onto Facebook, so I'm not sure if, um, if uh, there's questions out there, if there are any questions, I know Sergeant Hill or Sar Sergeant Martinson would uh, let me know. Right uh, now, I don't see any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm gonna wrap this up with a, another video. And uh, this video uh, kind of puts everything that I've uh, tried to communicate to you today, hopefully have communicated with you, even with our technical difficulties, because uh, that's just the world that we live in anymore. And we've had to learn to deal with that and, and communicate through those technical difficulties. So um, uh, I'm going to show you this video, then I'll come back and see if there's any questions and we'll wrap it up. Have you ever talked with a friend about a problem only to realize that he just doesn't seem to grasp why the issue is so important to you? Have you ever presented an idea to a group and it's met with utter confusion? Or maybe you've been in an argument when the other person suddenly accuses you of not listening to what they're saying at all. What's going on here? The answer is miscommunication. And in some form or another, we've all experienced it. It can lead to confusion, animosity, misunderstanding, or even crashing a multi-million dollar probe into the surface of Mars. The fact is, even when face to face with another person in the very same room and speaking the same language, human communication is incredibly complex. But the good news is that a basic understanding of what happens when we communicate can help us prevent miscommunication. For decades, researchers have asked what happens when we communicate. One interpretation, called the transmission model, views communication as a message that moves directly from one person to another, similar to someone tossing a ball and walking away. But in reality, this simplistic model doesn't account for communication's complexity. Enter the transactional model, which acknowledges the many added challenges of communicating. With this model, it's more accurate to think of communication between people as a game of catch. As we communicate our message, we receive feedback from the other party. Through the transaction, we create meaning together. But from this exchange, further complications arise. It's not like the Star Trek universe, where some characters can Vulcan mind melt, fully sharing thoughts and feelings. As humans, we can't help but send and receive messages through our own subjective lenses. When communicating, one person expresses her interpretation of a message, and the person she's communicating with Here's his own interpretation of that message. Our perceptual filters continually shift meanings and interpretations. Remember that game of catch? Imagine it with a lump of clay. As each person touches it, they shape it to fit their own unique perceptions based on any number of variables, like knowledge or past experience, age, race, gender, ethnicity, religion, or family background. Simultaneously, Every person interprets the message they receive based on their relationship with the other person and their unique understanding of the semantics and connotations of the exact words being used. They could also be distracted by other stimuli, such as traffic or a rowling stomach. Even emotion might cloud their understanding. And by adding more people into a conversation, each with their own subjectivities, the complexity of communication grows exponentially. So as the lump of clay goes back and forth from one person to another, reworked, reshaped, and always changing, it's no wonder our messages sometimes turn into a mush of miscommunication. But luckily, there are some simple practices that can help us all navigate our daily interactions for better communication. One, recognize that passive hearing and active listening are not the same. Engage actively with the verbal and nonverbal feedback of others and adjust your message to facilitate greater understanding. Two, listen with your eyes and ears, as well as with your gut. Remember that communication is more than just words. Three, take time to understand as you try to be understood. In the rush to express ourselves, it's easy to forget that communication is a two-way street. 
be open to what the other person might say. And finally, four, be aware of your personal perceptual filters. Elements of your experience, including your culture, community, and family, influence how you see the world. Say, this is how I see the problem, but how do you see it? Don't assume that your perception is the objective truth. That'll help you work towards sharing a dialogue with others to reach a common understanding together. All right, so I thought that was a great uh, little video that showed how miscommunication happened. And he talked about a lot of the things that we've talked about in class um, and how you have to be an active listener and that um, I like the example that they used of uh, that the conversation was like a piece of clay and when you threw it back and forth to the uh, person talking in that communicate in that conversation that they molded those words like the clay into what they thought it was and then they threw it back and the, uh, the receiver um, molded it into a, a piece of clay of what they thought it was. Uh, I thought that was a really good uh, illustration and a visual of uh, the conversation because that's exactly how it happens that we might, uh, you know, we said earlier that the message sent is not always the message received because we're shaping that conversation as a piece of clay. We would a piece of clay. Um, so again, um, we talked a lot about the different uh, parts of communication, how to be an effective communicator. The you and I statements um, talked about the difference of complaints and criticisms. Uh, even though on the screen it had the same definition, there are two different definitions of complaints and criticisms, and they go along with the you and I statements that um, <clears throat> we wanna make sure that um, that we're making a complaint in our I statement and not criticizing the other person, which is a you statement. Uh, again, uh, a, lo a lot of information and you can put it in the context of coming back from uh, and reintegrating uh, into your family, into your job, into your schools, into whatever life looks like for you. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, when the uh, Colonel was on and speaking, he said, you know, no matter, I know from uh, last month, some of the, a lot of you, this was your first deployment, and um, some of you, it's just, you know, multiple deployments, but every deployment was different. And I found out even later on after uh, the fact, but help me prepare for this, that it was even a, not a, your typical deployment because you were still stateside and you were able to go back and forth uh, between your home and deployment uh, if you had to. And so that makes a, a lot of different things go on in the deployment. So uh, I leave you with this. Just remember that uh, words matter uh, and, uh, and that uh, along with the words, we have to make sure that our voice is saying what we mean and most of all that our body language and what we're doing goes along with those words because that makes up the biggest part of our communication is that body language and then is that voice and then that, that those words are really 7% of our conversation. So make sure that those 7% of your words uh, are really saying what you want them to say. I thank you for this time and uh, I thank uh, Yellow Ribbon for having me once again. Welcome home. Um, and um, again, uh, thank you for your service and I'll continue to pray for you guys. Uh, so I'm gonna um, send it back over to Sergeant Hill and um, it will take it from there. Thank you very much. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties. Hopefully we do not have any more. Uh, next up is gonna be TRICARE. Let me share that screen real quick. And Mr. Williams from TRICARE should be able to hop on right now and do our TRICARE brief. Good morning. My name is Brandon Williams. I'm a TRICARE East representative and I cover your area. And we'll be going over the benefits programs for a reserve during deactivation.
will cover what is TRICARE, eligibility, medical coverage, and other information. So here's your two region stateside. So TRICARE East is where I cover and we're part of Humana Military and TRICARE West is the Health Net Federal Services. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, yep, okay. So here's an important slide, keeping your DARES information up to date. This is important for y'all with beneficiaries as well as those without beneficiaries. One of the easy ways is going to an ID card office and doing a face-to-face -to, -face to get your information updated. One, that guarantees that you get your information updated that day. And two, it helps you face-to-face -face communication. You can do it via Mill Connect, but we rely on technology in that situation. And sometimes it updates, sometimes we it falls through the cracks. So um, another way is to call. And that is your second best option because you're talking to someone and getting your information updated. This system feeds into TRICARE, so it ensures your care uh, and your information is up to date and prevents you from dropping off of your TRICARE insurance. So here's your coverage life cycle. You are in the deactivation phase, so you deal with transitional assistance uh, management program, which is your TAMP, or the Continued Health Care Benefit Program. We'll go into medical coverage. So TAMP is an additional 180 days of your transitional health care benefits. So what this means is when you come off of active duty, um, you're, you're going to be transitioning into TAMP. So with this, you have to, um, you'll have your 180 days of like active duty care. So like TRICARE Prime, TRICARE Select, and your uh, beneficiaries are covered as well. So the one key thing with this, at the 180 day mark, you will drop off of TRICARE. So re-enrollment is necessary for TRICARE Reserve Select and TRICARE Prime where it's locally available. Again, I say you will drop off, so make sure that you call TRICARE around the 180 day mark and go ahead and re-enroll into your TRICARE Reserve Select to ensure your coverage doesn't drop. Next slide, please. So you have some program options, your TRICARE Select, your TRICARE Prime, which is in the PSAs, which are your prime service areas. And then you have the US Family Health Plan. It's, that is available in six designated areas. But one thing to note about that, if you go with that option, you are specifically assigned to that area and everything has to go through that area. You can't use military treatment facilities, military pharmacies, or anything like that. Everything goes through the USFHP. Now with TRICARE Select, it's, it's provider choice, as well as you can use any pharmacy. If you use a, if you live near a, mil, um, a military treatment facility that has a pharmacy, you can go through that and you won't have to pay anything out of pocket. So getting care with TRICARE Prime is a, you have a network provider and they will be your PCM. They'll deliver your routine care but with TRICARE Prime, you must get referrals. And the major thing with this is if you go to things like urgent care, you'll still need a referral. Don't deny yourself care though, go and get your care. And if you're unable to get in contact with your PCM, you can contact the TRICARE East number and they'll help coordinate you getting a referral to prevent from having to pay uh, major amounts out of pocket. Now the emergency room is covered, so do not hesitate to go to the emergency room either. So line of duty, if you're injured, if you were injured while on active duty, make sure that that information is documented and in your medical record. Also make sure that the investigation is complete because that'll allow you to continue to get active duty care for that injury. One thing to note with LODs is you only get care 
for that injury. So if you hurt your knee while on active duty, the LOD investigation comes back, it's founded, then you can get care for that knee. But if your right shoulder starts hurting, you're, you can't get active duty care for that. You would have to go through your PCM or your provider choice, and then you will start to seek care through that. Next slide, please. And this, like I said, your care needed after your orders expire. So coming off of active duty, the LOD, as long as it's been founded, you still have active duty care for that injury. So pharmacy options, if you live near a military treatment facility or mil military installation, go to the military pharmacy. That'll prevent you from paying anything out of pocket. There is the TRICARE pharmacy home delivery, which is through Express Scripts. You can get up to a 90 supply or 90 day supply of your medications through the mail and refills and everything like that will come directly to your home. You can use TRICARE retail networks. One thing I'd like to point out is Walmart is no longer a retail network pharmacy. So you will be paying more for your prescriptions if you go to Walmart. Using places like Walgreens and CVS, they are retail network pharmacies. So you'll be paying less out of pocket for your prescriptions. And then of course, if you go to a non-network, you're gonna be paying the full price. The TRICARE Dental Program, this is um, through United Concordia companies and the premiums depend on your status. So active duty, of course, you didn't have any uh, premiums and your family members, you paid less for them. If you used your TRICARE Select Reserve, then that's when the sponsor begins paying out of pocket. And then if you have more than one family member, you can see that you're gonna be paying about $72 or up to $83. Uh, for your dental treatment. And here's for your information. So the top left, the TRICARE East region, go ahead and take a picture of that or save that number in your phone because that's where you can do most of your updates as well as get any referrals checked, any authorizations that you need. You can double check and make sure all of that is taken care of to ensure that you no longer, um, to make sure you're covered before going to receive care. But like, like I said, if you're TRICARE Select, your provider choice, so you won't need referrals for certain specialty care, um, that TRICARE East Region number, you can call and ensure that you don't need a referral before going to prevent you from having to pay out of pocket. And then you've got your military one, sir, uh, one source for your EFMP. And then you also, uh, the tricare.mil website, you can find all the briefings as well as any, you can compare providers, you can compare plans and um, all your tricare information is found on that site. I don't have Facebook, so I can't see if you have any questions but make sure Sergeant Martinson or Sergeant Hill get your questions and or you can contact me directly at bwilliams123 at humana.com. And that's Mr. it. Mr. Williams, I also put the cost sheet on the yellowribbon.mil site. That's the site yep. that you guys signed up for. So mm -hmm. you can just go there and pull that right off and it'll break down all of the costs and have all these contacts right there. Yes, and just the no call sheet questions. is a big thing. So just check that out, guys, and it'll break down everything for you. All righty. And I don't see any questions on the Facebook page. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Good luck. Next up, we have Mr. Faircloth from the VHA. Greetings to all of you, welcome home. 
service members. Um, thank you all for your service. I have with me a team of <clears throat> VA um, participants, and we're going to talk to you about your VA benefits that you have been entitled to. This is our VA mission statement. Um, any VA you go to any country, this will be always the mission statement. And it is just here. And we always practice the I care a philosophy for integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. This is how we're organized. Um, there's, there's three parts to the VA. And most people really don't realize it. They just think it's VA, it's all encumbersome, but it's not. It's three parts. The benefits side, which deals uh, specifically with anything dealing with money, we like to say. Um, the healthcare side, we deal with your health to make sure you can uh, be around to receive the money. And of course, the National Cemetery, which is the ones that does all of your funeral um, possessions and, uh, excuse me, all of your burial possessions and things like that. That's one thing to note is that um, we always hear about Arlington National Cemetery, but um, Arlington National Cemetery is not part of the VA. Arlington National Cemetery is part of the Department of the Army, so please be aware of that. Here are some of our um, care services that we offer at our VA. Our primary care, of course, is just a basic health care, mental health, preventive care, specialty care, uh, inpatient, outpatient pharmacy. Um, if you're receiving VA care and you uh, consider using our pharmacy, if you're not service connected, our copays are typically very, very cheap, under $8 um, for some of the uh, medications. Um, so because of uh, your service uh, that you have performed, you'll be able to receive those at no cost for about five years. Uh, women's health care, uh, that is to include um, mammographies and um, pap smears and those things. And again, they'll be at no cost at this time uh, for the next five years. Um, also, here are some of the uh, surgical services that we receive, that we do. Um, and I know a lot of you now are in shape um, because you're still serving. So bariatric surgery is probably not part of what you would uh, need. However, we also offer um, optometry and ophthalmology. So if you need to have your eyes checked, you can come to the VA, <clears throat> get your eyes checked. And they also have eyeglasses that um, are offered to you, some at no cost, even um, uh, hearing. Uh, uh, we have hearing that you can also come in and have your hearing checked. And again, those, uh, if you need it, hearing aids, those again will be also available. Um, our program, Military to VA Transition um, Case Management, uh, Military to VA Case Management Program, is a program that we have uh, where we actually come in and we work with those veterans that are transitioning. Um, and because you are National Guard, some of you may transition out completely of the military and some of you just will remain in the military, but still just transition to VA health care. Our program works with you uh, to ensure that all of your services that you need to help with your transitioning are done uh, smoothly. We work uh, with you for about 90 days to ensure that all of your cases, all of your situations are, are handled um, and also provide any guidance that you may need, uh, anything dealing with uh, um, filing claims or any other um, outpatient surgeries or things that you may need. So our program is designed specifically for post 9-11 veterans. Um, some of you, if you've been in for a while, may remember us as OEF, OIF. We have changed names several times. Uh, hopefully this military to VA transition program will stay or case management program will stay for a while. Um, but if you come to the VA and say OEF, OIF, we understand who you are talking about. Mental health services. Um, we at the VA specialize in mental health services because uh, our um, Psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, uh, nurse case managers all are familiar with cases dealing 
particularly with veterans. Uh, we are different from an outside entity in that we deal specifically and only with veterans. So therefore we know more about treatment for, uh, processes and some of the ongoing issues that veterans see. Um, not all of our clinicians are, um, are just civilians. Some are even uh, veterans themselves. So we do have a great understanding of how veterans feel, how they, um, how they think, and, and we work directly with them and come straight forward as we know that the straightforward approach is best for veterans. So we do the straightforward approach. Um, and here are some of the services that we offer. Because we're stressed for time, I'm going to forego this one next. If you're a veteran who are homeless or at risk of, be of becoming homeless, um, here's the National Call Center line that you can call. Um, and what we have is programs available for you uh, to help prevent homelessness for veterans. Uh, for spouses and loved ones, spouses and loved ones, um, there's a coaching info care. Uh, program that we have for those uh, that's also dealing with the stresses of transitioning, uh, returning veterans back home. So we also have a program for them as well. Those are your websites for that. Mobile apps. We have several mobile apps that are VA approved, um, PTSD coach, uh, mindfulness. Um, there's also some um, calm and other ones that we have approved through VA um, so that you can use those free of charge, of course, and uh, help with some of the transitioning issues that you may have once upon your return. Dental care. So because you was on active duty for a deployment, um, you will, most of you will be eligible for a one-time dental screening with the VA. Uh, the thing about having that one-time dental screening is we at the VA, the, the healthcare side of the, of the uh, VA would need your current DD-214 that shows um, that your eligibility and there's one particular box, box 17, that shows if you have had dental care within the 90 days of, re of discharging. If it's yes, then you will not be eligible for the one-time dental care, but if it is no, then yes, you will be eligible for one-time dental care. Here's the caveat. You must submit that DD-214 to us within six months of the last day of your DD-214. So uh, I know you um, all have returned here um, before the holidays, so I'm sure your, your time may be uh, forthcoming, um, but you can contact us and we can get that information in to you. We will have contact information coming up shortly. There's some of the other additional services that we offer. Um, the MOVE program is one of my favorites. Um, MOVE program is uh, helps to um, help you with your dietary uh, intake, helps you to lose weight. Uh, I was on this program uh, before. Well, when I got out of the military, I was 190. Uh, six months later, I was 240 pounds. I've lost over 60 pounds because of the MOVE program, so I truly believe in it. Um, and so it's one of my favorite programs in the VA. So just FYI, these programs work if you put forth your efforts in working with them. Uh, here's some of the copay, and again, I'm gonna skip this because as you are deployed, you will have your five years of uh, free healthcare eligibility, so I'm gonna forego those. So let me let me just say what I mean when I say your five years of eligibility. Because you deployed overseas uh, and returned home, you are now eligible for five years of VA health care uh, for anything related to combat. So if you come to the VA saying that you have a uh, uh, you hurt yourself while you was on com on tour, um, we, the VA will be able to assist you and it will be at no cost. Now here's the difference. If you come to us and say, yeah, I, I deployed, but then I came home and I broke my leg, 
the VA will take care of you, but there will be a copay associated because it did not happen while you was on active duty. So, uh, my healthy vet is one of the um, softwares that we use uh, that allows uh, service members, veterans, to have 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 access to their health care. Several things you can do with my healthy vet to include you can track your medic medication, renew your medication, speak directly with your providers. Um, for any healthcare issues, you can review your notes from your past visits. Um, so there's so many things you can do. Um, schedule appointments, um, everything. So it's your all, it's your one shop go to for anything dealing with VA health care. That's why it's called my health event. So I just want to make that clear. It is for the healthcare side of VA. Uh, One of the reasons to enroll, this is something that you've earned. This is something that you have earned. Um, we all think that once we raise our right hands, there are several, several benefits that we have earned. Um, now that you have uh, deployed, you all have earned this, this uh, reason for health care. And I know that there's some um, senior enlisted and some officers on this um, call, and I want you to know that this is not just for the lower enlisted. This is not just for your junior enlisted. This is for every veteran. So even if you are a, a, a captain, major, master sergeant, uh, regardless, you are still eligible for VA care. And the, the great thing about it is it's enough to go around. Um, I know a few years ago we had about 22 million veterans. I know that number has decreased. Uh, but only about 11 million was enrolled in VA healthcare. So there's plenty to go around. And if you know someone that has uh, um, earned their right to be enrolled and has not registered, let them know. You bring them along with you and you get enrolled into the VA healthcare because it's for us. Application process is easy. There's a form that Sergeant Hill has attached um, to uh, you guys website called the 1010 easy application fee is very simple once you complete that information you can uh, send it to the uh, info below and they will be able to uh, get you registered um, or you can go online at va.gov and fill it out there as well that is the application next slide next Again, the enrollment process is very easy. Um, next slide. Here's the information for local contacts. Depending on your location or where you live, uh, these are the um, people in the uh, military to VA uh, programs that will be able to assist you. So Asheville, Durham, Fayetteville. Uh, Mr. Jermaine Thompson is our, our newest transition patient advocate down in Fayetteville, and he is on this call. So Here's his information. You can contact them, contact myself or the Asheville. Please take a picture. Three, two, one. Next. And this is for the Salisbury Charlotte area. Um, Mr. Tim Nason um, uh, is the program, uh, excuse me, the transition patient advocate in that area. Um, and of course, our Vet centers. Our vet centers are amazing. Uh, I think um, Lance, Lance Nelson is on the call and he's going to be talking about the vet centers and our amazing VA regional office in Winston Salem. Um, Mr. Darian Luke is also here and he's going to be talking about those. Next slide. Any questions for me? Again, I'm not on the Facebook site, but um, I do have the chat open and I do not see any questions in the chat. I don't see any questions on Facebook either. Awesome. This are Hill. That 1010 EZ can be found on the yellow ribbon dot mill site, the same site that you guys registered on. It's in the handouts down below. You can download it and you can turn it right back in. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Next slide. Hey, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? 
Can yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes. perfect. All right. Um, my name is Darren Luke. I work with the, the Department of Veteran Affairs and the benefit side of the house. Um, what I want you to walk away with this, I'm just going to do a quick down and dirty about the the benefits that you've earned for your service. And I want to thank you and your family members for your service to our country. Um, as a retired as a retired reserve soldier myself, I have a passion for what you do and and serving you. So I want to, I am very sincere about you reaching out to me. Any questions you have? So I'm on the compensation side. So that's for disability benefits. So I know you might have education questions, but I, I am here to help you. So uh, next slide, please. All right. So. This is basically what, what I want you to do is VA.gov is where you're going to find all the information you need. So we're just going to walk through this really quickly to kind of give you an idea of what you can information you can find. So if you go to our website, all right, this is going to lay it out. If you go down towards the bottom, there, you're going to be able to find these, this um, setup. Okay, so um, you just heard about the VA healthcare benefits and actually on the website, if you click healthcare, you can actually go right to the healthcare stuff. Um, other benefits that you've earned now, you could potentially, let's say that you got hurt in service um, and, or you are service connected for something already and you need to change your career. Uh, you could potentially be eligible for what we call vocational rehabilitation benefits where the VA would help pay for schooling and change your uh, career, um, life insurance. So I know those of you have SGLI now, um, if you're looking to get out of the national guard, um, VA actually has life insurance that <clears throat> they can actually uh, provide to you. Um, very similar to, um, SGLI, uh, that you can purchase. So you could click on that link and get more information about that. Um, if you want to file compensation claim, or let's say you already have disability compensation you had before you went on this deployment and you want to file an increase, um, you can click on that and it'll walk you through what you need to do. Uh, we'll talk a tad more about that here in a second on my next slide. Uh, pension benefits, something you probably won't want to need. It's more of an income-based uh, benefit. Um, also, if you're interested in burial memorials, you can click on that to see what you're eligible for as a National Guard soldier. You do have benefits in the future if you're planning for that part of your life down the road where you could be buried in a, a state or a national cemetery. Um, education and training. So those of you that um, have been using your education benefits for school, you may have questions about starting it back up or now how can I use my GI Bill? Um, I know a few of those answers. However, if you click on this, you go to this website, you click on education and training. They have all kinds of great information. You can actually either talk to someone online or there's a 1-800 number there. You can actually click on and you can talk to, um, you can, I'm sorry, you can call somebody and they'll talk to them and, and talk through that kind of stuff with you. Um, also um, housing assistance. So the other big question we get is, now I'm interested in, um, I'm back, I want to get a, um, a VA loan. How does that work? Um, well, the VA doesn't actually give you a loan per se, but what they do can, can do is give you a certificate that says they'll back a loan for you and you actually take that to a bank, okay? So what you do is you get online, you click on this housing assistance and you can actually um, request and get your certificate of, of what they call a certificate of eligibility for your loan and you can do it online and get that and then you take that to a bank and then you'll have that uh, or you'll take that to the bank and then you'll have that when you get your loan completed and that's something else and then the last thing and this is kind of interesting is record so um one thing you can do is when you get out of the national guard and you no longer have your va id or your id card um va you can actually get a, 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 a um, id card through the um VA as well, this still allows you to get discounts and stuff, so which is actually kind of nice. It's another little benefit. All right, um, next slide. All right, so getting a little deeper on the, the um, compensation side of things, just a couple things. This is things I hear from National Guard soldiers. If you file a, um, a claim for compensation, basically what compensation is, you injured yourself in service, all right? You're, you're now you're, you're off active duty and, and you, you're trying to get um, health care for that particular injury and uh, monetary service. So basically one of three things have to happen. First, you have to have shown it in service. You have to currently have it and we have to connect the two. 
you can be in National Guard status, drill status, and get VA benefits at the same time, okay? They just offset themselves. So what happens at the end of the fiscal year, we get a notice from the Department of Defense, you have 60 days of um, duty time, and the VA will offset your, your check, uh, your monthly checks for 60 days, okay? The second thing, now that you just came off active duty, if you got injured in service, if you're going to file a disability compensation claim, now's the time to do it, okay? I know some of you are um, um, HUA soldiers, just like, you know, um, we were saying earlier, you're young, you're, you're strong, you're in shape or whatever, you're not going to be that way forever. It's very, very important. Even if you get 0% stuff, stuff happens, you get older, stuff starts falling apart, really think about it. It's much easier now, once you're off active duty, if you file a claim within a year of discharge, their effective date starts the day after discharge, and it's much easier to get something service connected and prove it within that year, okay? So that's something to think about. Um, for those of you that were that had compensation benefits and had to stop them once you went on deployment, okay? To get them started back, all I need you to do is you have my email address and I put it back there on the bottom again. Just email me a copy of your DD-214 and in your email statement, Darren, um, you talked to me at the yellow briefing on whatever date, today's the 12th, please restart my benefits, okay? That's all we need to do. And then the last thing um, they asked to remind, and this is a new, a new thing, a new legislation that went through. Um, recently, we, we had some legislation with Gulf War presumptives. Um, these are three big, all dealing with respiratory issues. Um, you might not have them now, but within the next 10 years, if any of these manifest themselves, you could file a claim for them um, and potentially get compensation for them as well, okay? All right. Does anybody have any questions for me on any of that? And I'm not on Facebook. Let me just, if I may, uh, Darren, just add that okay. uh, Gulf War presumptive, um, if you are familiar with burn pit registry, this is just a little bit different than the burn pit registry, but at the same time, it is dealing with burn pits. So, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes, thanks, Sean. Okay. All right, two things for me then, no questions. Darren Luke at va.gov and www.va.gov. And I'm dead serious. Email me. Please do it. And there's no crazy questions. I've helped a lot of National Guards. I've been blessed to do it, so I'm very thankful to do it. Again, thank you for your time, and I appreciate your service. Thank you very much. This is Sergeant Hill. Uh, next up is USAA. I have an update on why everyone got kicked. Uh, it was a Facebook content kick, so everyone got kicked off. Uh, we apologize for that, and hopefully we don't get flagged again for content. Okay, good morning. Hey, I'm glad to be here and, uh, for the invitation. And um, I'm gonna talk briefly in regards to finances after deployment. Uh, my name is Command Sergeant Major Retired Butler Jimmy Kendrick, and I am the Terry Affairs representative for the state of North Carolina. Next slide. Um, before we get started, just wanna talk about a disclosure here. And it basically just emphasized that um, I'm not here to solicitate or uh, offer to sell or buy anything in regards to um, my presentation to you is strictly in regards to post deployment finances. Next slide. Yes. The agenda that we're going to talk about today is. Um, financial considerations, and I just want you to keep in mind throughout this brief, um, first and foremost is uh, finances, and then you need to think about family, and don't forget about those friends in regards to um, the amount of money you have received during that deployment. Next slide. This is our mission statement. As you know, USAA has been around um, since 1922, um, actually, June 20th, we are coming up on our 100 year anniversary. 
our main focus in life is to be the provider of choice for our military service members, our families, their families, the veterans, retirees, and individuals that are considering um, to take an obligation to serve in the military. Next slide. Okay, this is a assessment here in regards to post deployment. And I'm telling you something that you probably already know, but just want to rekindle that thought in your head in regards to um, your background and you probably have a whole lot of cash. Um, don't forget about those bills, as you know. And the main thing I want to say is those big ticket purchase items, such as a house, um, a brand new car. Um, really think about that. I always use three rules um, in regards to big ticket purchase items. And first thing I ask myself is, is it a want or is it a need? Second thing I ask myself is, you know, can I do without this? I'm gonna take 24 hours and I'm gonna rest and then I'm gonna come back to the resource in regards to what I'm trying to purchase. And the third thing I always ask myself is, let me speak to one of my mentors um, who probably have been through this situation before and I'll get some advice and then shop around and make the best decision. Um, remember, um, as we redeploy back, um, you can't make up for lost time um, in regards to spending a whole lot of money in a short period of time. Next slide. Okay, recharge and restart. Win for plan, um, it may be applicable to some of you, but basically a win for plan is a plan that you receive an amount of money that you are really not expecting. Um, it could be anything from a bonus. It could be anything from you went down range and you received a whole bunch of money in regards to that initial paycheck. But it's, it's money that you don't expect and it's probably more than your regular income. Spending plan, a budget. Just please make sure you, you look at things um, in regards to the percentage amount, um, what you're going to spend and how you're going to spend it um, in regards to transportation, housing, and a big thing is retirement. Saving and investment, next slide. These are the three savings and investment plans. Um, number one, you should always have an emergency fund. If you didn't acquire that while you was downrange, I would ask you to seriously take a look at establishing at least a three month expense plan with about 500 to a thousand dollars to the side or whatever you can afford um, to have just in case there's some type of catastrophic event and you may need the funds. Intermediate goal. Investment for goals that's three to 10 years out, uh, such as CDs, mutual funds, saving bonds, um, stock funds, you may want to look at if you're going to establish those, try to make sure you get a stock that you're willing to go at least five years out. And again, um, be careful in regards to investments um, because nothing's guaranteed with investments. And as you see, our stock market today, um, it's a lot of things that's going up and down in regards to um, the market. Long-term, 10, 10 or more years, please look for that time to invest for retirement. Um, it will come real quick. Um, I didn't know that 31 years in service would come that quick for me. And um, there's a lot of things you should take a look at um, while you actually still in uniform. Uh, TSP, remember to take advantage of that. Um, remember, that's a matching contribution and it can save you in the long run. Uh, 529 college saving plans. Uh, while your children are young, if you still have young children in the household, please look at them and think about um, a college plan that they probably will need um, as they mature and um, want to advance in regards to higher education. Next slide. TSP and RA, um, as you see, the, the difference between a TSP and an individual retirement account is that the TSP, the major difference 
with a TSP is um, you have a matching contribution with a TSP. Uh, with an IRA, you don't have a matching contribution. Um, also, the annual amount that you receive um, in regards to the contribution that you could place into a TSP is $20,500, and for IRA, it's $6,000. One thing you must keep in mind, um, if you withdraw, in most cases, before the age of 59 and a half, um, you will or can be penalized. So keep that in mind in regards to withdrawing um, a TSP or RRA. Next slide. A Roth TSP and RRA. Um, a Roth is a different type of TSP or RRA. Um, it basically means that you are taxed at the very beginning, and then when you withdraw it, you do not or you will not be taxed on that amount. Uh, with the traditional TSP or RA, you are not taxed or you are taxed up front. And then, or uh, correction, you are not taxed up front, but when you withdraw it at the tail end of it, then you will be taxed on it. So the traditional um, up front, no taxes, but at the end, when you pull it out, you will be taxed. With a Roth, you are taxed up front. Uh, when you draw it out, you will not be taxed at the retirement or whenever you plan to pull it out. Next slide. Financial readiness. Um, I will tell you, make sure you take care your loved ones and your possessions. Um, be aware of identity theft. Um, individuals are out there and they are searching for military individuals. Um, they know we probably have a routine, so be careful in regards to um, your possessions and your funds. Keep in mind, save for emergency. Um, please try to have an up-to-date financial plan um, due to the fact that you came back and things have changed. Please take a close look at that. And I'm gonna leave you with um, the thought of take care and look after your battle buddy. Everyone came back with different goals, different possessions, different type of accomplishments, and some things have changed. And just wanna make sure we look after our battle buddy um, in regards to you know, making sure they take care of themselves. And the last thing I want to leave you with, if you have any questions about um, post-deployment, um, you could go to usaa.com slash your military life. I will also provide this to Sergeant Hill. And if you want to reach me personally, you can reach me at butler.kendrick at usaa.com. That concludes my briefing, pending your questions. Currently do not see any questions. Uh, we're gonna move on to Military One Source. Looks like they've been dropped. We'll just continue to move. Hey, Sergeant Hill, I'm here. This is Wes Armstrong. Sounds hey, everybody. Good, you ready to yep. go? Super. Uh, uh, Today we're going to talk about savings and investing. Uh, it's a good follow on to the USAA uh, presentation. We're going to cover some of the tricks. I think the difference is that we are a, uh, I'm a personal financial counselor, so I am uh, um, empowered 
employed by the office of the secretary of defense the office of financial readiness um, and we are thank you sir i'm Les armstrong like i said uh, this slide is going to be up for a few minutes uh, because i'm going to go over since we're going to be talking about savings and investing i want you one of my goals is for you to take advantage of all of the uh, benefits that are available to you at the national guard uh, that you can look at that as savings i look at that as something that that every one of you should take advantage of every day. So welcome back. Um, the first thing that you should take advantage of is uh, working with us. We're uh, I'm a personal financial counselor with the North Carolina National Guard, and there are three other, I mean, two other personal financial counselors available to you. I'm in the triad region, uh, uh, and my territory to meet with you face to face is from 50 miles on either side of Winston Salem. So my territory runs from Wilkesboro in the west all the way to Burlington in the east and down to Ashboro and Salisbury in the south. Uh, we have another financial counselor. His name is Michael Fines, and he is in uh, Charlotte, and he can meet with you anywhere in that 50 mile radius around Charlotte. Uh, Michael was a former federal prosecutor, and he's been a certified financial for about 30 years. Uh, Steve Brady is in Wilmington, and so if you're down east, uh, he'll, he's available to meet with you around Wilmington, uh, in 50 miles around Wilmington. All of us are available to meet with you in person, on telephone, on video conferencing applications, by email, and by text. We're uh, Our mission is to promote uh, financial readiness, and we offer services including presentations like this one, one on one counseling, and help with long term financial planning and budgeting. All of our personnel are well trained, uh, and we may even have a financial planner in Raleigh soon at Joint Force Headquarters. Everything that we talk about is confidential, and it's at no cost to you, and none of your information is shared unless uh, it comes under the duty to warn uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, comparable private sector consultations with personal financial counselors or certified financial planners uh, can cost you in the thousands of dollars. I've been a certified financial planner since 2005, and I've been in the financial services industry since 1998. We're available for one-time questions or for full financial planning engagements. And we like to say that we should be your first stop, even if you plan on working with USAA or some of the other fine financial institutions that are associated uh, with the military. Uh, it's a good idea to talk to us first because we don't sell anything all we do is offer you good financial advice. So that's one way that you can save yourself some money is by working with the financial counselors for the North Carolina National Guard. Another uh, service that you should use, now we're, we're, not, we're still staying on this one. Another service that we should use is legal services. In, your, uh, in the download side, uh, some of the documents you can download today are one that has my contact information and it and it also describes some of the um, some of the services we offer. There's also a pamphlet for legal services. That's another service that you should take advantage of as a member of the North Carolina National Guard. Uh, there are really four documents that you should have on hand for yourself and your spouse or your partner uh, at all times, and those are simple wills, a power of attorney a medical power of attorney, and a living will. The legal services office at the, uh, in Raleigh can help you prepare these documents so that, your, so that your family is prepared should something happen to you. They also offer tax services. In the downloadable uh, document, there's a number that you can call to uh, get them schedule an appointment with them to do uh, these four documents. Um, 
if you would like, I have a form that they use, one of the forms that they use to start the process. If you send me an email or send me a text, I'll be happy to send you the, the document. Another of the services that you should use as and that you're eligible for as a member of the National Guard are employment services. They can help you uh, tune up your resume, write up as resume. They have a current job listing uh, for all National Guard members. Uh, they do interview skills. They are a great resource, and you should take advantage of them. IBHS is another. Uh, service that you should use as a member of the National Guard uh, just to talk about what's going on with your life. Uh, the National Guard also offers educational services and ways to save money to improve your marketability and family services if you need some help with, uh, with anything else related to food insecurity or uh, school supplies. Military one source, I noticed they weren't on here, but uh, Wayne Smith, he's a great guy and you should check on uh, Wayne, Wayne, definitely check with Wayne Smith for everything that military one source offers. As a member of the North Carolina National Guard, you also have an eligibility to join a number of credit unions. Uh, State Employees Credit Union is uh, one of the organizations that you should uh, contemplate joining, as well as Navy Federal Credit Union. One of the things that I like about credit unions is that they offer higher rates of return on demand deposit accounts, on savings accounts and money market accounts. They also offer lower interest rates on loan products, so mortgages and things. So these credit unions are, you should definitely take advantage of Navy Federal. They're the largest credit union in the world, and they have great pricing power. Now, with regard to USAA, one of the things that I've found is that USAA offers car insurance and homeowners insurance to military members, and the prices are uh, definitely competitive. So whenever you need car insurance or homeowners insurance, you should check out USAA. If you've been in the service, uh, for six years, or if you can swing it while you're still on active duty, you should definitely check out the uh, Veterans Loan Guarantee, just that the Veterans Affairs representative just talked about. That'll save you money, and if your credit is challenged, it's a place where you can get a home. Some of the other benefits I'd like to talk about for about two more minutes are SGLI. Please enroll in SGLI. It's the cheapest life insurance that you'll ever get. It's seven dollars per hundred thousand, and it's a great deal for you and for your family should you pass away. Uh, the TSP we're going to talk about in a little while, but the TSP is also known as the finest employer-sponsored retirement plan in the world. The reason for that is it's a low cost to you. Uh, the TSP is to cost its participant. 39 cents per hundred per thousand dollars invested. A similar Duke Energy plan will cost you three dollars and ninety-five cents per thousand dollars invested. So the TSP is 10 times cheaper than a Duke than the Duke Energy plan. And Duke Energy is the largest utility in the country. So they have great pricing power as well. There are also well-managed funds. The TSP has BlackRock as the investment manager and BlackRock is the largest investment manager in the world. So I encourage each of you to join the TSP and to uh, invest in it as much as you can afford. You have a pension with the federal, with the uh, National Guard. Uh, you don't have to do anything to get that other than to stay in for 20 years. But uh, we like to call that mailbox money, and that's something that is a real benefit to you, especially as you age. Uh, when you get older, uh, when you get close to filing for your pension, you should call me because there's something that's called the Survivor Benefit Plan. 
some people uh, sign up for that without thinking through the ramifications of that. Uh, when you get to that point, we need to discuss it. When you get to the point of leaving the military and transferring your life insurance to VGLI from SGLI, we need to talk about that as well because VGLI increases in five year bands. So the cost, the premium cost increases from 40 to 45, from 45 to 50, from 50 to 55, and so on. And what happens is it, it only gets a little bit more expensive every five years, but then when you're about 65, between 60 and 65, the cost per month goes up a lot. And so what happens is most people drop their VGLI coverage when they're 70, let's say. And then if they die when they're 71, their uh, beneficiaries don't get anything. So let's talk about VGLI when you're getting ready to leave the, the military. Um, I think the only other thing that I'd like to talk about, and if you want to talk, is to get your RPAM. Be sure to print out your RPAM. That's going to tell you how much uh, you can expect to receive from your pension should when you leave the military. And then I want to ask you to do a, do yourself a favor and do me a favor. Create a love me book that care that includes all of your orders and anything military related. Uh, the military is a great organization, but they do lose things. And if you can document your everything that you've done while you've been in the military, you're going to be a lot better off. Okay. Sergeant Hill, we're going to slide two now. That's yes, thank you. That's, I guess that's slide three to you. So today we're gonna to talk about saving and investing uh, fundamentals. We're gonna talk about investment accounts and then we're gonna talk about uh, resources that you can uh, use to help you stay on track with savings and investing. Next slide, please. So if you guys, with some, with the extra money that you made while you were deployed, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to save it? Are you going to invest it? Or are you going to spend it? If anybody's out there, write in the chat box what you're going to do with it. I'll give you a minute to, to answer that question, and we'll see how many people are paying attention. Sergeant Hill, just let me know if anybody pops up. One answer was crypto. Crypto. Good deal. Are you going to invest in crypto or save in crypto? And let me know which crypto you're going to invest in. I've seen some payoff debt, invest, invest Great. and pay off debt. Super. That's uh, exactly what you need to do. Flight school. The flight Good. school. Make sure that you contact the education department see if you can get that paid for you. That's right. Absolutely, Sergeant okay. Hill. Pay off super. debt. Invest. Pay off debt. Boot super. So there's some people out there. Save. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna. This is gonna be. This is a fairly basic conversation. But if you'd like to talk about crypto, I can't really give you uh, financial planning advice about it. But what I can say is that crypto might be. Let me emphasize the question. The uh, might be where the internet was in the 1990s. There's a lot of chatter about that, and people have people have indicated that that's where they think it is. Um, Web 3.0, et cetera. I guess only time will tell with crypto. And one of the things that I'm interested in understanding about crypto, uh, this last kind of meltdown with crypto has been consistent with the meltdown in the stock market. And people in the industry always say that Bitcoin should act like gold and should be a um, 
uh, an, uh, a move in a similar way to gold. And I'll be interested to see if if crypto, if when, if what happens in Ukraine, th I think is going to happen in Ukraine, where the Russians are going to go over the border, if uh, Bitcoin moves upward, if that happens, or if it moves consistently with the stock market. Um, so anyway, that's a that's a question. Uh, so next slide, please, sir. So in this uh, presentation, we look at uh, saving and investing fundamentals and uh, key concepts. And if you will, that one of the forms that I ask you to download has this key savings and investing fundamentals. And you can go to the next slide, sir. Uh, and then just click on compounding. So, so all of these, you can click on all of them. We can, we can open them up. Um, so compounding, Einstein had a, had a saying that said that compound interest was the greatest power in the universe. And so compound interest for those of you who don't or compounding for those of you who don't know is if you had a hundred dollars and you, you had a 10% rate of return on it. Um, then the 1st year you'd have 110 dollars, but the 2nd year you'd have 10% of 110 dollars, which would be 121 dollars. And then the 3rd year. If you're still earning the same 10%, you'd have uh, $132, right? Or $133. And the next year, you'd have $145 or $146. And that increment above the uh, straight line, I mean, 10% rate of return is what's known as compound interest and it take or compounding. And it takes a while for compounding to take effect. But once it does take effect, uh, it dramatically increases your rate of return. So what we like to call it is interest on interest. And it takes takes a while for that to take effect, but it's a it's a wonderful thing. We had a uh, a uh, sergeant major here in Greensboro who started investing a hundred dollars a month in. Uh, the 1990s in a Standard & Poor's 500 index fund, and he invested $100 a month from 1991 to 2021, so 30 years, and he had invest, invested $1,200 a year, so $100 a month uh, over those 30 years. So he had invested $36,000 into the Standard & Poor's uh, 500 index fund, and when he retired last year, he had over $700,000 in his account. That's what compounding will do for you. It's the difference between the $36,000 you've invested and the $700,000 that you have in the bank over 30 years. And so I would encourage each of you to start early and to invest as much as you can, as early as you can, especially in tax qualified accounts like an IRA or a 401k, the TSP or an IRA. Diversification is a concept uh, uh, put forward by a guy named Harry Markowitz back in the 1950s, and it stated that you could get a greater return with much lower risk if you buy uh, uh, different kinds of assets like stocks, bonds, uh, real estate, uh, foreign exchange, things like that. So you should strive when you're investing to have a well diversified portfolio, small company stocks, large company stocks, international stocks, international bonds, things like that. A dividend is, uh, well, you, can, you guys can read this. Dividend is a return of uh, equity to the shareholder, whereas interest is uh, the amount of money that you're paid from a savings account. Liquidity means that you can turn things into cash quickly, uh, and then rate of return and risk is something that you want to try and avoid uh, when you're investing, uh, but you do need to know that the more risk you take, the greater uh, potential return you have. Next slide, please. Thank you, Sergeant Hill. 
Uh, so the key difference between saving and investing is really um, savings r refers to anything uh, we like to say lower than five years, less than five years to a goal. You should be saving for it and not investing for it. That way, if something happens in the interim, like a 2008 market meltdown, your money will be there. It takes a long time for your money to recover after a market meltdown. So you need to, if, if you have fewer than five years to your goal, then you should be saving for it. If you have greater than five years, you can invest uh, to reach your goal. Uh, saving has very low risk. Uh, they're typically, uh, those accounts are typically insured by the uh, federal government, whereas investing uh, can have very high risk. You should uh, understand that investing, you can lose money. Um, liquidity, uh, savings accounts are uh, super liquid. You can walk into the uh, bank and get money out of your savings account. Uh, you might lose a little bit of interest if you're uh, if you're cashing in a CD or you are, uh, if you're cashing in a CD, but you're still going to get your principal back, whereas investing, uh, you may not get it all back. And then uh, the rate of return is typically tied to risk. So uh, a rate of return on a savings account is almost nothing right now, but that's fixing to change, whereas the rate of return on, on investments uh, can be quite large. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so these are different types of savings accounts. If, if the interest rate goes up, so if the federal reserve raises interest rates 4 or 5 times this year, which it, it looks like they might. What you'll see is a, uh, increasingly a differential between these accounts. Deposit accounts are like savings accounts. Money market accounts are very similar to savings accounts and CDs are where you invest some money and it stays in for a certain period of time. Um, when interest rates have been, been depressed for the past two to five years, you haven't really seen much difference between these accounts. But if, but if you're in a, a high interest rate environment or a high inflationary environment, you will see a pretty big difference between these two, especially on the longer end of the certificates of deposit. So, as interest rates increase, um, uh, CDs become more uh, favorable, uh, more enticing. Where, whereas you'll always want to keep some money in a deposit account for emergency funds. The other two, the money market account and the certificates of deposit become uh, more attractive as interest rates rise. And if you have any questions about that, you should uh, uh, send me an email or send me a text and we can talk about it. Next slide, please. Uh, this is about emergency savings. Basically, you should have three to six months of committed expenses. That's not, not income. That's committed expenses in your, uh, in your, in a savings account, in a highly liquid account. And then you can increase that as, you, as that goes along. And the re you sacrifice your rate of return for liquidity. Next slide, please. When we talk about diversification, this is a fairly simplified type of discussion of diversification, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. I wish that they had put uh, exchange traded funds in there because that's where most people, that's where the mark, that's where the industry is going. Uh, but uh, in a simplified form, this is, what we would do with diversification. Uh, bonds are a loan from you to a lend to a borrower. So when you buy the G fund in your uh, TSP, you're actually lending the federal government money. And in exchange for that, the federal government is paying you a, an, a rate of interest. Um, there are municipal bonds. Those, these are pretty popular. I'm gonna take a drink. There are municipal bonds. They are typically tax free at the local level and potentially tax free at the federal level. 
So as we normalize interest rates, uh, municipal bonds become uh, very attractive for higher income individuals. Uh, they are backed by the full faith and credit of the taxing authority. So Greensboro is going to issue some bonds. Greensboro School District is going to issue some bonds uh, to build some schools. You can buy those bonds and they'll pay you back a rate of return tax free. Um, and then there are corporate bonds. Corporate bonds are more risky than uh, federal bonds, the G fund, uh, but they are backed by the uh, by the ongoing by the ongoing concern of the business. You, they are liquid. You can sell them before maturity, but you may not get your uh, your entire amount back. Your entire amount you invested back. If you hold them to maturity, you will get the original invested amount plus interest. Stocks are uh, you own a piece of the company uh, when you buy a stock. Uh, stocks sometimes pay dividends. That's a return of profits to the owners. Uh, you can sell them at any time. They're high. Most of them are highly liquid, uh, but stocks can go up and can go down. Look at uh, Belks or look at Nordstrom's. Uh, look at some of those old uh, Sears, for instance. Stock market, they can go down. Blue chips that were blue chips in 1990 and 1980 aren't blue chips anymore. Mutual funds are pooled investments, as are exchange traded funds. Um, they, their risk of loss is lower because you buy 500 stocks in each of the mutual funds. Uh, same with exchange traded funds. There are minor differences between the two. Uh, mutual funds sell you and sell mutual funds at four o'clock in the afternoon after the market closes whereas with exchange traded funds you can trade them intraday so if the stock market goes up in the middle of the day and then comes back to where it was at the beginning your mutual fund would trade at zero uh, losses or gains whereas if you had traded your exchange traded fund in the middle of the day when the stock market was up you would have made a gain those are the difference. There are also some tax differences. If you want to discuss those, we can discuss them. Um, I'm a big fan of exchange traded funds because they have extremely low fees. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Great. Um, there are qualified. So, so when you buy stocks and bonds, you buy them in typically in qualified or non-qualified accounts. Qualified stands for tax qualification, which means you receive favorable tax treatment. Those are IRAs, uh, 401ks, et cetera. There are also non-qualified accounts where you buy your stocks and bonds with uh, after-tax after -tax dollars. Qualified accounts have investment limits set by the IRS. Next slide. So you can there there are brokerage accounts and there are retirement accounts. Um, brokerage accounts are where you can go in and buy stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Typically, you used after tax dollars. Retirement accounts are broken into two pieces: individual retirement accounts or individual retirement arrangements in the vernacular of uh, the IRS, and then employer sponsored plans or employer sponsored retirement plans. Uh, both of these retirement accounts are tax qualified plans by the IRS. Uh, individual retirement accounts have a $6,000 limit this year. If you're over 50, you can add $1,000 to that. Uh, 401k plans and the TSP have a, a limit of $20,500 that you can put in. Uh, if you're over 50, you can put in another $6,500. Next slide, please. I think we just went over the contribution limits. Uh, vesting has to do with ownership. So if you're in the blended retirement system and you're within two years of joining the service, 
Uh, you are not vested in your in your employer contributions, but you are always vested in your employee contributions. So if as an employee of the federal government, anything you put in to your TSP, you own. Same with 401ks. Uh, withdrawals are limited to uh, any time after 59 and a half uh, for retirement accounts. There are some special circumstances uh, that you can get to your funds before 59 and a half. And if that's the case, or you want to talk about that, you should give me a call. There's something that's called the 72 T, which also stands for substantially equal periodic payments. And that's designed for people who started early and retired early. Uh, there are also other special ways that you can get into your individual retirement account for special purposes, such as first time home buying, and other things. We, if you have that need or have that desire, give me a call. Next slide, please. Um, we talked about the limit this year. It's six thousand dollars with um, with a thousand uh, dollar increase for somebody who's over fifty. Um, traditional IRAs, you can invest pre tax, so. You lower your current income by investing in a traditional IRA. Uh, you can also invest in what's called a non-deductible IRA. Some of you may have heard of what are called backdoor Roth IRAs. The way you use the way you construct a backdoor Roth IRA is by doing a non-deductible IRA, which is uh, the way you would do it if your income was too high to invest in a traditional IRA. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, don't take any money out before you're 59 and a half. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you pull money out of you, a traditional IRA, it's subject to income tax and that required minimum distributions so the IRS can get their money start at age 72. It's actually, the wording is the year after the year you turn 70 and a half. Next slide, please. Roth IRA. Uh, Kind of the uh, the other side of the coin from a traditional IRA. Excuse me. You pay taxes. You use after tax money to contribute to a Roth IRA. There are uh, income limits to a con to contributing to an IRA. I think it's, you're married filing jointly this year. It's around two hundred thousand uh, dollars. That's added together for both people. It's a little less for uh, for single people. Uh, the benefit to a Roth IRA is that the earnings you pay taxes now, but you never pay taxes again. So if you uh, invest in a Roth IRA, you put after tax money in, it grows, grows and grows and grows, and then when you're 59 and a half, you can start pulling it out without paying taxes on it. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's all. Same thing. Uh, 401k, $20,500. Uh, $27,000 if you're over 50. Uh, the TSP, I'll talk about the TSP. Uh, next slide. I'll talk about that. I think I got one more slide on that. Uh, Sergeant Hill, yeah, just fill it up with text here. There you go. All right, good. So TSP has the same TSP and the 401k have the, have really the same regulations. Twenty thousand five hundred dollars is the earning limit. Six, excuse me, sixty five hundred more if you're over fifty. Um, they have a Roth side which you put in before taxes. They have a an after tax side which is the Roth side. If you're having trouble or you're reaching another tax category or another tax um, ledge, then you can use the traditional side to reduce your current income so that you're under one of the thresholds for, uh, for tax, uh, for higher taxes. Uh, there's also a Roth side. So for many people, the TSP or a 401k is really their biggest tax shelter. Um, you can shelter if there's two people 
and you're over 50, then you can shelter $54,000 in the TSP and 401k. <coughs> the um, good thing about the blended retirement system is that there's a match. So you, if you put in 5%, they can put in 5%, they'll put in 5%. Uh, my suggestion is that you should strive to reach 20% of your income in your TSP something magic about that number if you can put in 20 percent it seems to be that people are well off when they do retire but if you can only put in 10 percent of your income please put in 10 percent of your income next slide please all right and then there's some great resources military one source consumer financial protection bureau office of financial readiness any of these if you have any questions um I can direct you to these. Uh, they have great uh, calculators that are available and the TSP has some great t uh, stuff too. I love the TSP. Thank you for your service. Uh, welcome back. If anybody has any questions, put them in the chat box or download my contact information and give me a, give me a buzz. I'd love to work with you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. One question I would have is, yeah. do those on the blended retirement need to be doing different than those of us who are not in the blended and will have that, you know, 20 years of service, we get uh, a retirement? Is there anything well, they, they, they still get a retirement. Theirs is just reduced. Um, so the, so the people who are, the people who are um, in the high three, which is, I think, you, Sergeant Martinson, right? Um, you're going to get 50% of your, when you, basically, if you served for 20 years, then you would get 50% of your uh, income, of your base income from the, the pension. Those that are in the blended retirement system are going to get 40%. So the trade off is that they get, 40% of their pension, plus they get the 5% match. And so the theory is, and it's actuarially sound, just in case you wanted to know, um, that if they invested that 5%, well, 10% really, um, then they should have a similar amount to, to make up for that 10% difference. Um, my suggestion is that people are growing older and that they're living longer. And so you need more of your portfolio portfolio to be aggressive, aggressively invested for longer. And if you're able to pay for all of your expenses out of the 40 or the 50% of your pension plus social security, then you should, uh, other than five years of committed expenses, your your portfolio should be fairly aggressively invested into your 70s. That's the that's the um, that's kind of the uh, evolving way that we're looking at it. But everybody's situation is different, so contact me and we'll we can talk about it. And I'm available to talk to anybody who wears a uniform. So if you have any specific questions, sometimes people don't want to share their questions uh, on the internet. I certainly understand that. I'm available uh, anytime during business hours and a lot of times on weekends to uh, to address any questions that you might have. Are there any other questions? Mr. Armstrong, I put all of your handouts on the yellowriven.mil site so you can download them right from there. With your contact thank you super thank you sergeant hill and and thank you for uh letting me present today is uh, wayne smith on now i hope so y'all have a great day thank you
All right, I'm not seeing that military one source can unmute uh, for some reason, but uh, military one source is a is a great uh, resource to go to for a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> all you have to do is go and sign up. It is free, and any of their um, services that they offer are free to military service members. Next up, we have Master and Jones from IG. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, Master. We can hear you. Great. I am Master Sergeant Jones. I am one of the next slide, please. I am uh, one of the assistant IG slash IG and COIC here for the North Carolina National Guard. This is our current organization chart. We have Colonel Iden, who is an active duty Title 10. Um, as the IG, we have Major Hollowitty, who is the Deputy AGR, Major Cochran, who is Deputy MJ, myself, and um, Command Master Sergeant Jenkins for Air Guard MJ. Next slide. So I'll let you read this slide. Um, the mission of the IG is to provide objective, unbiased advice and oversight to the North Carolina National Guard through timely and thorough instructions, assistance, investigations, and training. Um, the biggest point is that we work for TAG. We work directly for the Adjutant General, and all of our directives come from the TAG. Um, our goal is to assist anyone who submits a, a complaint to our office. And, and I'll speak on this term, you'll hear not IG appropriate a couple of times throughout this, um, this meeting today. Um, not everything will be IG appropriate, but in those instances, if we're not the office that's able to assist you, we will provide you with the information um, to the, the source that is there to assist you with your issue. I'm um, teaching train, we use our knowledge and our experience um, to teach and train commanders, soldiers, um, units on issues that they're having with their commands, whether it's um, linking them to regulations or policy memos so that they're better equipped to lead their soldiers. Um, we do inspections. Um, right now, we're currently doing an inspection of the North Carolina National Guard retirement system. And our, our goal with those inspections are, you know, we highlight things that are going good and bad. Um, and the ultimate goal in everything that we do here in the IG's office is to make this a be better organization for all the soldiers and um, the leaders together. So that's always our main focus. And investigations, um, we only conduct investigations when we are directed. And like I said, those directives come from TAG. Um, we are not CID. I mean, we will get um, requests for assistance from soldiers or um, civilians that will say, I want you to investigate this person. And we explain to them, like, that's not how this works. We're not CID. Um, and so we don't just go around and investigate people. If there's a need for an investigation, it will be at the directive of the tag. Next slide. And again, this is just a breakdown of the IG function. Again, there are four inspections, assistance, teaching and training, um, and investigations. Um, the majority of our IG complaints or inquiries are assistance, where we're assisting a soldier who's having a pay issue, promotion issue, a bonus issue. Maybe they need clarification on um, the promotion system, how to submit a promotion packet, things of that nature. So we do get a, more assistance cases than we do of any of the other um, three. Next slide. So doing those assistance functions, we provide soldiers with um, an alternate to the chain of command when the chain of command is unable to solve their problem. So one of the first questions that our office will always ask a soldier is, have you um, informed your chain of command of your issue and given them the opportunity to resolve those issues? Um, 
and most of the cases that we receive will be referred back to the chain of command um, if it's something that's a command issue. So if it's a soldier that, um, let's say they went to training and their DTS still hasn't been paid yet, like we will refer, we refer all cases when they are referred to the command to the brigade command level. And then we allow that brigade commander to um, resolve those issues, whether they resolve it directly with the soldier or they, you know, delegate it down to their battalion or their company commander. Um, but it is a major contributor of our IG workload, just assistance function. Next slide. And whenever you contact the IG's office, we will, um, whether you send us an email or you talk to us over the phone, we will use this intake form as a DD form 1559. Two of the most important um, parts of this form are blocks 12 and 13. And what that is, is the privacy act. And it's you consenting to the release of your name and any supporting documentation in order to, for us to help you resolve your issue. Um, if you choose not to, re to um, release your you know, your name or your supporting documentation, it does limit us in what assistance we can provide to you. I mean, it's a case by case basis, so we will definitely explain it to you more in depth based off of um, the circumstances of your inquiry. Next slide. This is a list of people who can submit an IGAR, so a request for assistance from the Inspector General Office. So that soldiers, family members, retirees, commanders, other services, contractors, the media, um, anyone can request assistance from the IG's office, but how we handle those cases, um, that's a completely different part of that process. Um, they won't all be handled the same way. Next slide. Um, the next function is the inspection function. And again, this is just in AR 1-201 or the North Carolina National Guard Regulation 1-201. And really, we just inspect different items. We've inspected the promotion system. We've now inspecting the retirement program for the National Guard. And again, it's just our job to um, point out what's going good as well as what's going bad and with the ultimate goal of just making it a better program. Next slide. The investigation function. Again, we work for the adjutant general, so we will not investigate anyone based off of an inquiry of, you know, a complainant wanting us to investigate someone. So we'll definitely um, collect all the information that's provided to us, do an analysis of that information, and then what we what comes from that um, analysis will determine what the next steps are. Next slide. So these are the IG trends for um, FY21. It breaks down the majority of our cases. And a lot of our cases, um, if you see on there in the bottom left, you'll see MRPE, RCMC. So that was um, the program that rolled out right as the 30th Brigade was coming back from the mold as far as handling soldiers who had received any type of injuries or medical concerns while on the mobilization. Um, it was a new program with a bunch of kinks, and we were definitely a part of that um, ironing out the kinks and trying to, you know, make this program work. So that was a 10 percent um, of our functions, or our, our IG cases came from MRPE, RCMC. But again, we have um, pay issues, promotion issues, and the same for FY20 promotion, pay, and TRICARE. Um, we're very high on that list of cases that we receive. Um, and, uh, and when you say information, it's a lot of soldiers that, or civilians that contact us for um, anything. Like what regulation covers this? Or which office can I get assistance from to file my taxes? Like we log every inquiry that comes into our office so that we're able to establish trends on um, the assistance that we provide to the force. Next slide. You might be stuck. 
There we go. Lessons learned. So AR 600-20 is um, like the Army Bible. Um, we reference that regulation a lot on, you know, how commanders need to command, how soldiers need to soldier. So um, anytime that someone contacts the IG's office, anytime someone contacts the IG's office in our response to you, um, if there's a regulation that governs any part of what your inquiry is about, we will reference that regulation and we will give you the Army regulation and we will give you the um, paragraph and subparagraph as well to support all of our answers um, because our goal here is to always stick with the regulation. Um, you know, emotions aside, our goal is to always give the information straight out of a regulation and AR 600-20 is one of those starting regulations for us. Um, communication is really big. We've learned that whether it's communication from the bottom up or the top down, um, it's important to communicate and that's why our number one question to soldiers or whomever contact our office for assistance is, does your chain of command know about this issue? Um, because our goal here is not to step in and act on behalf of commanders. We want commanders to command um, and, and allow them to um, run their commands as they see fit. And some, a lot of commanders at the top are not aware of some of these issues. And that's why when it's a command issue, we believe in um, forwarding those concerns to the brigade level so that everyone at every level is aware of what those issues are within their formation. And open door policies, commanders cannot fix what they do not know and that ties right back into communication. Um, so again, even if you tell us, no, I did not let my commander know, that's not gonna stop our intake process. We'll still take your complaint. We'll still do an initial, an initial analysis to establish the best course of action to address your issue. Um, but we just want to let you know that, you know, it is a command issue and it's very likely something that didn't need to be elevated to our level, but we'll still ensure that, you know, you get the support that you need in order to address those issues. Next slide. Um, these are some of the resources that we have out there. Um, the biggest thing is our email um, inbox. Although you have our faces um, on that first page, um, I think we removed our individual email addresses. That way, um, everyone has access to all emails. Please send us the email to our IG inbox. We also have a SharePoint page on um, GKO, NCGKO, and then we have handbooks. We have the IG handbook, the company leader handbook, our training booklet. If you go to our SharePoint page, there are links to all Army regulations on there, and they're linked to the um, publications website. So you'll always have the most up-to-date regulation when you click on one of those links. So again, if you have any issues that have um, happened at any point, whether it was during the mobilization or any time after the mob, and you just need some, you know some guidance on something, and whether you've gone to your chain of command or not, we do. Um, recommend that you allow your chain of command to resolve your issues, but in the event that that's not the case, um, feel free to reach out to us and we will assist you. Next slide. My last slide. Okay, that's our last slide. Um, again, thank you for your time. Welcome back. If Again, if you have any questions, please send us an email or give us a phone call 664-6182 and um, we'll be here to assist you. And that's all I have for you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Wayne Smith, were you able to get on? Does not look like we have military one source. Uh, we're going to continue on to the education department.
I think they need a couple more minutes. We'll go to Ms. Franks from ECU. Well, greetings. Um, this is Amy Frank. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Ms. Frank, we can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, again, my name is Amy Frank. I'm uh, at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. Um, I am faculty within the College of Engineering Technology in the Department of Technology Systems. So um, this one, can you go ahead and click, uh, let's see, about five times there. Yeah, there you go. Um, so in my department, we have five undergrad programs of which two options are 100% online. So depending on if you want to move to Greenville or if you want to continue to be located elsewhere, we do have some online options for you. BS in design has two concentrations in architectural technology and a mechanical technology. That one is main campus daytime. And, and then uh, distribution logistics is a very popular one with the military. So with this one, um, it is 100% online. Um, so with this one, you can get an SAP certification within the program itself. Um, it is a very popular one and very well taught. Uh, the BS in Industrial Engineering Technology is a main campus daytime program. So this one is uh, an algebra level. Actually, all our programs are algebra level math, but a lot of applied laboratory courses involved. Um, the BS in Information and Computer Technology is, has three concentrations under it, um, and it aligns with uh, cybersecurity, computer networking, uh, web um, web server technology and among other things in there. Uh, very popular program uh, here at campus and actually a lot of our folks end up hire, being hired through the RTP area. The BS in industrial technology is an AAS Applied Associate Science Transfer Program and that has eight concentrations under it of which six of the eight concentrations are available online. Uh, and I want to mention too that our department, uh, actually the BS in industrial tech is our is the number one program at EC utilizing um, military benefits. So a very popular program among the military. So let's go to the next slide and then if you would hit that three more times, there you go. So the BS in industrial technology, I wanted to point out because it's very military friendly. Um, part of the, the curriculum is built around an applied associate science, um, but military come in with an MOS that is very similar to an AAS degree. So we're looking for on your military transcript, your JST, um, at least 24 hours of technical or management industrial related ACE credits. If you have that background, we waive the Applied Associate Science Transfer Program and then therefore your training, your ACE credits or technical credits come in as block credit. We actually take 38 hours of uh, technical credit and then um, we also bring in um, some general education requirements. So with this program, um, you typically, if you have community college credits, the limits that we can apply from a two-year institution is 60 hours. Um, but when you bring in military credit, that's considered four-year institution credit. So that may kind of go a little bit over your head, but we're here to help you with all those confusing things. So these eight concentrations are listed here, architectural, mechanical, bioprocess, manufacturing, distribution, logistics, health information technologies, which aligns IT with health information, uh, and industrial management, information and computer technology, and industrial engineering technology. The, the last six there are 100% online. So it is possible to complete this degree 100% online. 
Um, so let's go to the next slide and then there should click four times on that one because of my transitions I forgot to remove. So once, uh, once you get your undergrad, you may be considering a graduate level. So we do have these options as online options. We have an MS in Network Technology, um, MS in Technology Systems, which focuses more on areas of emphasis in logistics, manufacturing, um, quality, um, and those areas. We also have a Master's in Occupational Safety. And then lastly, we do have some graduate level certificates as well. And I want to mention too, we have something called an accelerated bachelor's to master's that if you're enrolled in our bachelor's program, that there may be an option for you to overlap up to four graduate courses with your undergrad with appropriate uh, planning. So uh, next slide, please. And I think you're going to have to hit that one four times to get all this, the entities up. So um, again, my name is Amy Frank. I am um, a good resource if you have a variety of transcripts and you would like an unofficial evaluation for any of those programs that you saw in the previous slides. Or if you're just not sure, just send in, you can email me your transcripts from either email address. I answer both and I'll be able to assist. Uh, the phone number there is my direct line. And then the URL above, CET for the College of Engineering Technology, ecu.e slash tech systems, you can um, review program information. There's program flyers in there and other information on our website. So, um, and if these programs may not align to your career goals, I do encourage you to consider ECU um, for other programs, and you can look at if you want an online option at online.ecu.edu. They have a listing of all our online degrees at ECU. Again, that is online.ecu.edu. Okay, I think that's it. Um, let me know if anybody has any questions. I'll hang around here for a little while longer as well. Thank you very much. Next up, thank, we have Wade Thank Tech. you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Anthony Garns. I am the Career and College Access Coach uh, for Wake Tech. I also have with me uh, Miss uh, Marilyn Terrell. She is the Dean of Veteran Programs, Veteran and Special Programs at Wake Tech. She'll be in the chat filtering any questions in case you all have any questions. Obviously, towards the end of the slides here, we'll, um, we'll actually open up mics here and uh, address any questions you may have. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, in case you all were wondering, that we do have several campus locations, specifically with this Wake County map here. I love showing this map because it kind of outlines where we have uh, campus locations at. Um, specifically, um, campuses one through five this focuses on university transfer and skilled training jobs. Um, so, if you are interested in coming to Wake Tech, specifically taking online classes or um, taking um, or utilizing any benefits we may have. I would definitely consider one of these campuses as your options. Uh, six through nine are more specialized campuses for either high school or industrial training. Next slide, please. Areas of study. Um, I am actually posting a link here in the chat. Uh, this is our information packet. This is all things as far as specific, specific programs that we offer in certificate which are usually six to eight months to completion. Diploma programs are usually 12 months to completion. And then our social degree options, which are typically two years. Um, the information packet I posted in the chat is, um, will outline everything in admissions that you need to do. It also have the point of contact information for our veteran service department. Um, in case you have any questions about your specific benefits as a soldier. And then we also have an outline of all the programs we offer at Wake Tech inside that information packet, as well as the offering of the credentials. So we have a lot of programs at Wake Tech where you can actually earn three credentials. Uh, for example, um, we have simulation and game development. Um, that is a two-year degree option at Wake Tech, but a lot of our students enroll in that two-year degree in simulation and game development. And then they also earn two additional credentials, and that's the certificate 
and then the diploma option. So you can essentially earn three credentials within a, uh, a two year period. Uh, so depending on what your goals are, what industry you're looking at getting into, we really do have something as you see noted here on the slide, um, as far as industry and fields here, we have something for everybody. So take that into consideration. Uh, I don't have, unfortunately, a lot of time to go over all the programs, but that's why I wanted to post that information packet so you all can further review what specifically we have to offer uh, for our programs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so as far as distance education, um, I'm happy to say that we currently offer eight programs online. Those programs are listed here. Um, obviously, these programs here are specialized, but we do have a uh, third, fourth bullet down, the Associates of Arts. That is considered a university transfer option. So if one of your goals are to come to Wake Tech and to work on general education courses, and what I mean by general education courses, I mean like, your English is your master sciences, not um, major specific or career industry specific courses. And you wanted to take those classes, those general classes and transfer them over to, for example, ECU. Um, you know, we actually have um, a partnership with ECU called Pirate Promise, uh, which guarantees uh, admissions provided that you meet uh, or continue to meet a certain GPA while you attend uh, Wake Tech. So that's one of the partnerships we have. Um, that, you know, I incline everybody to take a look at and learn more information about, especially if you were interested in one of the programs that were discussed uh, with the uh, ECU speaker today. Um, in reference to hybrid uh, model courses, we do have the flexibility of students that might possibly want to take uh, their math classes on campus and maybe some of the sociology and English courses they, they might find easier um, to uh, pursue and be successful in to take those classes online. Uh, so we do have a hybrid model where you can take classes online and take classes uh, in person in a, in a more traditional classroom setting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I alluded to earlier, um, university transfer options. Um, so typically, a uh, traditional student would go to a four-year college, they'll complete their bachelor's, typically takes four years. Um, essentially what you're doing with the university transfer program at Wake Tech is you're working on your first two years of that university transfer program. Depending on what your major and what industry you wanna go into will depend on what university transfer program you pursue at Wake Tech. Um, we have staff here, I'm here obviously, we have academic advisors to help and walk you through that process, but I have a cool little graphic as currently shown right now to give you an idea of on what typical university transfer option, um, you know, would be uh, more beneficial to you based on what you want to major in. Um, most of our students complete the university transfer program, which essentially you're working on the first two years of your bachelor's. They're transferred to ECU, NC State, um, any of the university and colleges in the state of North Carolina to complete their junior and senior year. So essentially you're working on your first two years again at Wake Tech, and then you're working on your last two years, which are more than likely the courses that you are majoring in, whether that be biology, nursing, chemistry, civil engineering, graphic design, so forth. Next slide, please. Um, so just a quick run through, um, the information packet that I provided does have a more in-depth uh, run through of the admissions process as well as academic advising. There's a piece in there as well as uh, financial aid and the point of contact for um, uh, our military uh, affairs department, which we do have veteran zones on all of our campuses specifically designed for soldiers currently en enlisted or soldiers uh, transitioning or ETSing out. Um, so we have a lot of support for our, our veterans and current, uh, and current soldiers that are currently serving now as well. This kind of outlines the application process. Um, all of our admission applications are free. Uh, we don't have any deadlines for our admissions applications, but I do want to point out, obviously, we don't want um, students enrolling, you know, the week of classes starting, right? But um, I just want to mention, in case you need that flexibility, um, we do have uh, options available for you to complete your application virtually or in person. Uh, and the information packet provided in the chat does go over that. Um, we do not have... Um, SAT, ACT requirements, uh, that's across all community colleges in the state of North Carolina. Um, so what I'm talking about as far as admission requirements, that covers all community colleges in the state of North Carolina. We have 52 of them. 
Um, so we do recommend, uh, obviously, you submit your high school transcripts or any college transcripts that uh, you might have attend, uh, attended in the past. Um, obviously, um, if you are in a MOS that directly translates into a field that you're currently pursuing in at Wake Tech or another school, obviously, we recommend to bring over your arts transcripts as well to receive any transfer credit. So that is a realistic option for you to knock out uh, a few classes. And again, obviously that will be dependent on your MOS and what program you're pursuing at Wake Tech or any other college. Uh, I do wanna note that a lot of programs that we have at Wake Tech do have mandatory information sessions. Um, so keep that in mind when you are researching programs, uh, interested in particular programs at Wake Tech that uh, in order for you to move forward in the admissions process, you do have to sit through either an in-person or a virtual information session. That's not for all of our programs, but quite a few programs, especially in our health sciences um, division, there are uh, mandatory information sessions. Um, and then after that, uh, we encourage you after you attend the information session that you meet with an advisor to go over your program. Um, our advisors are our veteran zone uh, counselors, they do a great job of sitting down with students, walking them through the registration process and also helping them um, schedule their classes um, each semester. So if that's something, if you're not familiar with um, taking college classes, don't know how to go about registering for classes, uh, we have staff, we have veteran counselors there in our, all of our veteran zones and all of our campuses. We have general advising. Um, and, and then admission counselors as well, even if you're having issues with the admissions process, we do have staff available to sit down with you either in person or virtually and walk you through the admissions process step by step. Um, for, um, for more information, um, you can definitely visit apply.weektech.edu as noted on the bottom of the slide here. Um, we are offering currently campus tours. Uh, we have a lot of virtual and in-person information sessions that are going on. Um, a lot of it is what I covered here, but um, it's about an hour long. So you can imagine it's a lot more in-depth uh, information that you'll be able to have access to and be presented to you and able to you all to um, answer any questions you may have about a particular program that you might have heard that we offer. Um, unfortunately, I'm more so talking today about the college credit side, but we do have a whole nother other side of the division with our continuing education. Um, that might be covered under uh, your military benefits that you might be eligible for, such as being a real estate officer. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, health science programs that fall under there. Um, so definitely something to take a look at. Again, I encourage everybody to look through the information packet to see what we have, off, uh, have to offer. Next slide, please. All right, this is my contact information. Again, uh, you see my email address, phone number. Uh, that last link at the very bottom, the appointment with me, that's a shortened link. So that'll pull up my calendar where you can actually set up a virtual appointment with me. If you have any questions about the admissions process, anything dealing with Wake Tech, uh, I'll be able to assist you. Um, Marin Tabrell actually posted her email address. Again, she's the Dean of Veteran and Special Programs at Wake Tech. She posted her email in the chat as well. But um, if you are wanting more information, um, you have a, a particular interest in Wake Tech or one of the programs that we offer, or just have some questions. Feel free to email me, call me, or set up a virtual appointment with me as well. Uh, I look forward to uh, to helping you all navigate your educational journey uh, with Wake Tech. Thank you very much. Uh, I did something very similar with the university transfer. I went to community awesome. college for two years, and I transferred to San Diego State to get my bachelor's degree. Uh, saved a lot of money, and it was a yep. good experience. Definitely, definitely. It does, it does work. Definitely. And just to note, I served um, nine years in the military with the 101st. I spent my last three years as an Army recruiter. And it is possible to earn a bachelor's degree while you're currently serving. Um, I did that. I earned my bachelor's degree and I used my GI Bill to earn my master's. So I essentially, I did it, you know, in a way that I didn't have to come out of pocket for anything. Um, it is definitely doable. Uh, it, it does require patience. Um, and so that's something that you can definitely achieve. Yeah, Thank I just, and, yep. oh, hello, um, and thank, uh, thank you all for your service. We are, I'm also an Army veteran, and we are here to assist you at Wake Tech. It's a military-friendly institution. After you finish the application process, or if you have a question before, during, or after, we're here to assist you. So, um, 
please um, get in touch with us if needed and um, have a great day. Thank you. Next up with Mr. Kristen Hall with SART. Thank you. Hey, Sergeant Hill, this is uh, Mr. Hall here. You got me? Got you. Roger, sorry about that. I actually wanted to uh, make sure I went and grabbed something to uh, show everybody, but uh, I don't think my camera is going to be able to show that, so it's okay. Um, I'm wearing the uniform today, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, I do uh, also drill, such as uh, you, um, but I am also your state SARC. So I'm going to introduce myself. You can see our slide here. Um, I don't have a lot of slides. I just want to provide this information for you. Uh, this will probably go shorter than um, than it needs to be. Uh, so, um, I think uh, what I want to do is just, uh, first of all, welcome you all back. Um, thank you very much for your service. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we talked about the SHARP program. I'm sure you've had many briefings on SHARP during your mobilization, during your deployment, probably your DMOB as well. I wanted to re uh, remind everybody of who I am. Um, I'm your state sexual assault response coordinator, and uh, the slide also shows our victim advocate coordinator. So, Ms. Patterson and I run and manage the SHARP program for TAG at Joint Force Headquarters here. Your unit has trained uh, victim advocates at the brigade uh, and battalion levels. Um, nothing's changed as far as the program. When you come back here, now back on Title 32, uh, we provide all these uh, oversights uh, on the program. We assist the commands with any reports, uh, investigation processes. We assist our commands also with the training requirements of both unit victim advocates and your annual trainings. So most likely you're going to get another annual training this FY uh, with either myself or a um, uh, trained and certified victim advocate. The only thing I wanted to make sure that we uh, recognized and reminded everybody of is SHARP does cover both sexual harassment and sexual assault. While you were deployed, sexual harassment would be handled by a SARC, such as myself, uh, somebody in uniform or a civilian that's trained and certified, and they handle sexual harassment complaints. While you were back here, at, uh, back in Garrison, Title 32 in your units, sexual harassment issues and complaints are actually handled by EO, your EOL or an EO advisor at your brigade level or the state equal employment management team. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. However, I want to make sure that command and everybody on this call understood that even if it is sexual harassment or you think it's sexual harassment, if you have a concern or a complaint you'd like to file, it does behoove you to probably talk to a SARC or a victim advocate SHARP personnel because you never know if it actually involves sexual assault as well. If you talk to an EO and it involves sexual assault, um, that confidentiality uh, will not be saved for you. They have to uh, report that to leadership. So I'm gonna pause there for a second, ask Sergeant Hill or um, Mr. Martinson if there's any um, actual uh, questions, concerns, or comments so far. All right, good, hearing none. Um, I did want to remind everybody of the reporting options. Uh, the reporting options are restricted and unrestricted uh, for sexual assault. Um, and if a, an individual a survivor files a sexual assault report and it's unrestricted, I wanted to make sure that everybody on the call and leadership is aware that that is mandated to be investigated. Once again, though, please, as a commander, as a leader, you do not investigate. You do not ask any questions. You don't even get a sworn statement. Call your victim advocate, call your SARC, or call your JAG, and we will make sure that we take care of the process for you. Because it has to be investigated either by local law enforcement while we're here in, uh, um, you know, in uh, Title 32 status, or if it did happen uh, downrange or um, during uh, deployment, uh, CID would be involved. Um, I do, I do want to make sure that everybody on the call, God forbid, if something did happen during deployment and you did not report it, you still have that right to report it to me or a trained uh, and certified victim advocate. And I 
promise you we'll do our best to take care of you and have it investigated. Uh, I did want to highlight reports of retaliation because that uh, IG spoke a, a few moments ago, um, and I wanted to make sure everybody was aware that uh, retaliation is a big issue when it comes to uh, anyone who's filed a sexual harassment complaint, a sexual assault complaint, uh, either against the uh, person who who reported it, the victim, uh, even the reported perpetrator, or, um, um, you know, anybody involved in that, any witnesses. Or anybody who's actually intervened and stopped a sexual assault or sexual harassment uh, incident, um, if there's any retaliation that's been reported on those individuals, that will be highly investigated and highly taken seriously by command. Uh, we've seen uh, some unfortunate issues with that in the past, but we're taking it very seriously now. So once again, if you have something that you'd like to report on that, please don't hesitate to, uh, to speak to either IG, JAG, or our office. We can help you with that process. And the only other thing I wanted to show you and discuss real quick was that this, uh, if you could see this card right here, uh, the, uh, if, if you can see me on video, if not, it's okay. There's a new Army Sharp reference card that should be coming out um, if you don't have not received it already with your annual training uh, for Sharp. Um, this is the uh, training going forward. Uh, training won't be really with any slides or any videos. It can be, um, but it's really pushed by headquarters department of the army to actually have face-to-face -face conversations to have uh, uh an, you know the co conversation between you and your leaders your commanders sarks victim advocates we're going to talk about this pro this the process and we're going to talk about the subject matter in a serious uh manner um but also you know be more down to earth more you know you know um face to face so that we uh don't bore everybody with slides any longer so um I think that's all I have at the moment, uh, Sergeant Hill. I wanted to make sure that everybody had this slide that they're seeing with my point of contact information. Uh, it does reflect our new army.mil emails. Those are our office numbers and our cell numbers. Uh, our cell numbers are 24 seven. We do occupy that those phones all the time. Um, however, if there's somebody does not get that uh, a live person to answer that line, uh, we're going to refer you to IBHS, the Integrated Be Behavior Health System, uh, because they are manned 24-7 with a, with a live person for any crisis intervention. However, um, I want to make sure they had all this point of contact. So, uh, Sergeant Hill, uh, Sergeant Marston, if there's any questions, concerns, comments from leadership, uh, I, stand, I stand by. Okay, it looks like we have Ms. Sierra, and your slides are good to go. Hi, great. Thank you. Um, sorry for the delay. I was trying, my computer decided to restart and run updates. So I apologize. I appreciate your patience. But um, my name is Morgan Sierra. I am the North Carolina Regional Director for the Lone Survivor Foundation. And we provi provide a six day post traumatic growth program for veterans and their families who are experiencing any symptoms of post traumatic stress, tr uh, mild traumatic brain injury, or chronic pain or caregiver stress for those spouses. Um, our programs are located either in Texas or in North Carolina, and we offer a variety of tools there that are designed to really address the symptoms that veterans struggle with uh, following you know, combat service or military life in general. Um, you'll see there the offerings that we provide each one of the programs. Um, what makes us unique is that we're bringing all these youth all these tools and things that veterans can utilize along with the families to address the trauma under one roof. So we prevent that service member or veteran from having to go out in the community and seek the different resources. We'll bring them all into you under one roof and allow you to try different things and see what works for you. Um, we are very simple in our application process. We go to the next screen, please. So um, I forgot to add this one there. We do the, uh, mindfulness and counselor check-ins as well. Um, if you are someone who is not able to get away for six days at a time to attend one of our programs, we offer these check-ins. They're completely free 30-minute sessions that you could do with one of our counselors or one of our trauma-informed yoga um, instructors. They will offer you anything from resources to breathing tools, exercises, um, say you are a veteran or a service member who's struggling with back pain and you need something else to kind of relieve that that you can do at home. 
our yoga instructors will help you walk through different poses and things to help you with that. Our counselor check-ins, very simple, uh, very similar. They offer you a variety of tools. They're not going to do psychotherapy over the phone um, because these are simply 30 minute check-ins. But again, they'll offer you coping strategies and tools and different resources. Um, we don't have a cap on how many of those you can get. You can simply go to our website and sign up for a check-in and then we'll reach out to you uh, shortly thereafter. And next slide, please. Our eligibility is really quite simple. We will see any veteran either pre or post 9-11 we're not concerned about your discharge type. So if you've, um, I know most of you are actively serving in the Reserve or National Guard, but if um, a veteran has an honorable or dishonorable, whatever it is, we're not gonna hold that against them because we understand many veterans may have chose to self-medicate some of the trauma that they were dealing with. So we're, we welcome you. Um, also, um, we don't require that you have any type of um, diagnosis or that you have a VA you know, a claim with the VA for a particular rating on something. We are going to take you at your word with your um, reported symptoms that you're dealing with. So if it's headaches or trouble sleeping, whatever that may be that are symptoms of PTSD, we'll work with you on that. Um, as far as applying, it's very simple. It's that lsfprograms.org. You simply apply on our website and then we will immediately send you an application to your email. And once that's completed, our team reaches out to you to offer you um, some dates and let you know when we can get you into our uh, programs. But again, these are for spouses, the veteran or service member and their family. So um, there's my contact information and I hope to hear from you. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. We'll, we'll leave this up for a little bit. Let people get the information. Mr. Martinson, this is Carol with Mini Warrior Project. I'm ready to go whenever you guys are. All right, you can go ahead. Okay, awesome. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a great day. My name is Carol. I'm the alumni manager for Wounded Warrior Project out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. We're um, very glad to be here today and to spend some time with y'all this morning. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, Wounded Warrior Project, I'm sure everyone has seen our commercials and kind of thought to yourself, well, what does Wounded Warrior Project do? We have several different programs that assist active duty service members and retirees who've incurred a service-connected injury, illness, or wound on or after September 11, 2001. And that is an injury that may have occurred downrange or a training accident, or something happened while you were in on duty. And that includes visible wounds, like a burn survivor, amputee, maybe a broken bone, to invisible. So all that stuff we can't see. TBI, PTSD, anxiety, depression, cancer, um, degenerative back disorder or disease, anything that's affecting the veteran or service member that they've been able to claim with the VA that incurred while they were in service. We just don't help the service member. We're also here for their family. So the service member can enroll with us and so can their family support member. So that would be their husband, wife, brother, cousin, uncle, mom, dad, whoever helps them out, they can receive services from us as well. On this screen, you can see our four different program types that we have in our programs within there. On our connection team, we have our alumni team and that's my team that works with me. And our goal is to get warriors and their families out engaged with their community. And we do this through programs and events. We also have peer support groups throughout the United States. And we're even doing virtual peer support groups to help reach people in more rural areas or folks who just can't come out to a physical meeting right now. One great program we really have is our resource center. And on the next slide, I have that phone number, but it's a great number to have if you have any questions our resource center, what they do all day long is they answer questions from people about not only would worry project programs and services, but other programs and services. So if somebody was looking for a service dog organization, they could call our resource center 
and good service dog organizations in their area. Another team we have is our physical wellness team. And this team works on physical activities based on the service member's ability. So they'll do one day events where they might go to a Pilates class or rock climbing or just a hike through the woods. And then they do a more intense expo where they really focus on teaching healthy lifestyle habits and then doing a coaching follow-up program for about eight weeks. It's a great way to keep on track and know you're still being looked out for and to get that advice from one of our coaches. We also have our mental wellness programs. And this team focuses on, obviously, mental wellness and all of that. We don't do clinical psychological counseling services. If someone needed that, we can refer them to someone else. But we do have three programs to what uh, to which I'll talk about briefly is WWP Talk, which is a weekly phone call with one of our teammates to kind of discuss what's going on in your life right now. How's everything going? What are your goals? And they'll work with you for a period of weeks on your goals. If it was, I really want to get out of the house more and do more things with my family. They're going to encourage you every week and check in and see how you're doing with that goal. And then we have our project Odyssey team, which is a 12 week commitment. And it starts out with a screening phone call where our teammate learns what do you got going on? What are your concerns? What are you, what are you trying to move on to next? And then you'll attend a three day adventure based activity where you might go zip lining or whitewater rafting. And in the evening, after those activities have pushed you outside your comfort zone, they talk about it. What did we learn today? How can we take those skills and use them when we go back home? And then when you come back home from the Odyssey, they're following up with you, just like with our expos and our physical wellness team. We're just not teaching you the stuff and leaving you to be. We're teaching you stuff and checking up and following up with you. The great thing about Odyssey is we offer them for male warriors, female warriors, couples, and we've recently started family support member project Odysseys. So that's a great way to engage the whole couple in their relationship and everything and provide services for everyone. Our last team that we have is our career and VA benefits counseling. So we have our benefits team. And they work with all of the VA side of the house. So they can answer all the questions from, you know, education to voc rehab to assistance with the claim. They handle all of that. They can answer all of those questions. And we do get a lot of those questions. So they're a very busy team, but they're making sure they're looking out for the warrior and their family. And then we have our Warriors to Work team, and they help with everything related to employment. They will help you with your resume, networking skills, what to wear to an interview. We actually just did mock interviews this week with Warriors so they could learn what to do when you're in that interview setting. So that's just a couple of our programs, but this slide shows you everything that we offer. Next slide, please. And so here's our contact information. There's our resource center phone number. So. Go ahead, grab your phone, take a picture of the screen. We also have our website. On our website, you can learn more about our programs and services. We talk about all of our programs at uh, the top bar. There's a button that will drop down and you can click on any program to learn more. You can also register to be alumni with us from our website, or you can call our resource center. If you are in the Fayetteville area, you've got our address right there, and there's my contact information. One thing I didn't mention is we are nationwide. So if you lived out in Des Moines, Iowa, we have a team that covers that area. If we don't have an office in that state, we have a team that covers it. So I just use Fayetteville as the example. We're here in North Carolina, but we cover North and South Carolina. But we're nationwide, and I'm going to stay on for a few minutes. If anybody has any questions, you can pop them in the chat, or you're welcome to reach out to me via email, or you can text that is my cell phone number right there, which I just held up so you guys know it's near me. So thank you so much for all of your time today. And of course, thank you for everything y'all have done for our nation.
Next up, we have Chaplain Waters. Hey, good afternoon. This is Chaplain Waters. I'm the brigade chaplain for the 449. And uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thanks to you guys for all that you do. Um, been in your shoes, and, and I know what a, a big sacrifice it is to, I mean, it's got its perks, but it's also got its uh, intrinsic burdens that come with being deployed. And uh, I, I know that one of the burdens that comes with it is having to uh, endure doing yellow ribbon stuff on a beautiful day like today and uh, Valentine's weekend and Super Bowl weekend. And uh, so this is just going to be a brief brief. I, I hope that you can see my contact information. That is my personal cell number and my um, civilian email um, because that's what's most accessible to me. If, if you can't see it, if you're just listen, listening telephonically, um, my phone number is 252-945-8097. Uh, again, 252-945-8097. And just feel free to, to reach out to me. Just a couple things I will address. I know that um, coming back from both of my deployments is, uh, you know, you come home, I think, with this mental image of how life's going to be when you get back, uh, that hopefully you've saved up a little bit of cash and you're looking forward to seeing people you haven't seen for a while. And it's kind of like you go through that honeymoon phase and then uh, the reality of, of being back home with different responsibilities and, and uh the honeymoon period being over, it, it can get a little tedious and, and frustration, especially when you end up with some leave time and you have extra time on your hand. And and I discovered, you know, that when I was deployed, I felt like that I had this good schedule. I had a sense of purpose. I had a mission. You know, I, I felt uh, worthwhile. And, and then you come home, and like I said, once that period is over, you feel like you, you're kind of searching for a sense of purpose. So I encourage you to, you know, to, to go ahead and, and move into whatever that next thing is. Um, of course, with a lot of thought and consideration, but to, to begin to intentionally engage in whatever your next big step is. Um, and then I want to say too, I, I know that, you know, we can come back from deployment with some extra money and we make some big purchases sometimes on a whim and just want to encourage you to be thoughtful of, of any big decisions, uh, whether that's a relational or financial. Um, I, I know, again, sometimes relationships and the dynamics that come from a deployment, um, sometimes we can get into some heated arguments and, and uh, feel like the other person doesn't understand what we have endured and what we've been through. And the fact is, is that they can't and, and we, may not can understand where it is that they're coming from and having to take care of a household where another person has been gone for a while. So just be thoughtful and intentional with your decisions. Um, one thing, a couple things that I try to do in, to mitigate those things is to uh, count to 10 silently before I say something that maybe I ought not to say. And uh, then I also like to regularly ask myself, okay, if I do this, then what? What's going to be the consequence? Um, wh whether that's something, um, you know, a, a business decision, financial, relational, whatever. Temptation, um, you know, to kind of cope with whatever bad ha habit or addictions are available out there. Um, to take that moment and pause and say, okay, uh, if I do this, then what? Anyway, hey, I appreciate you guys. And again, my contact information is there. If there's anything I can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out by email, text, or call. Hey, bless you guys. I appreciate you. Can hear you. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead? Yes, please. Okay. Um, this is Danielle Presser. I'm the team lead with IBHS. I apologize. I was having um, technical difficulties this morning. Um, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, reintegration in the time of COVID. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, so I know that your service member has been back about 60 days or so, and you're trying to figure out um, what has been working um, since since their return. So I, I'm sure that you've heard this, especially if you have had multiple deployments, but um, it's important to manage your expectations of um, what you think um, should happen in the family, in your marriage, um, and make them a little bit realistic and, and talk about them with your service member. Um, because I think a lot of frustration can occur when your expectations are different than your service members or even any family members. So if you can kind of make them more realistic, I think that will go a long way. Um, and kind of consider, you know, what is what is the new normal um, since your service member has returned? You know, not what um, you think it should be, but you know, let's let's go back to realistic um, expectations again. And this is different. I mean, you may have gone through multiple deployments in the past, but you probably you didn't do them during a pandemic, and so that can make things look a little a lot different um, in um, your work, school, relationships, finances, and your mental health. So um, kind of consider how has COVID affected these things in, in my life? Um, you know, it might be that you're out of work because of COVID, or you've had to work from home and balance um, kids, even if they're back in school. You know, them coming home and being exposed, and, and then you have a five-day quarantine, and now you're trying to balance <laughs> trying to work with your children at home and managing their school and then, um, you know, what that your relationships look like. And maybe you're doing better because of COVID because of some of the resources, or maybe your finances are, are drained and, and you're really struggling. Um, and that all can take a toll on mental health. I mean, we have seen an up rise in, in requests for mental health services, both on the IBHS side, North North Carolina um, schools, um, in the community, it's really hard to get appointments. So it's not just the service members and family members that are struggling, but everyone in general. But I think with returning from deployment and trying to renegotiate all these things, it can be even more stressful. Um, and, you know, and I, I know maybe in the past, if you've had a deployment, you know, coping with your shifting roles since you're service member has deployed, I mean, that's always a challenge because maybe you have picked up doing the bills at the end of the month or picked up doing all the homework and, you know, things around the house and you have your way of doing it. And now the service member comes home and they're trying to put in their two cents and maybe they want to pick it right back up or maybe they don't want to do anything. And that could be frustrating. So it's kind of, again, having that conversation of what do we want and giving a little bit of leeway to have that service member and yourself adjust to again what your new normal is. Um, so, one of a big concern is addressing your children's needs in light of COVID. So, um, social skills have I've seen gone down significantly in in our children, and um, because they haven't been able to do the normal play dates and. Um, you know, they've lost a year and a half or more in school, just kind of socializing and being kids. Um, they've, you know, had to come back and, you know, if they've been exposed to COVID and so they may have gotten sick themselves or you've been sick. So, you know, they've had a lot of um, lost uh, social interaction and that's how kids learn and grow. So they must, may have been around family a lot, which is, is great, but I think um, not being able to go over to have a sleepover or play date or things like that um, and do those things that help the kids can um, cause stress in your family and in the children. So it's important to kind of be aware of how this is affecting your, your child as well. Um, and then how to be there in harmony. So um, because you're going to probably or may have been spending a lot of time together. And so it can be chaotic and sometimes it's helpful to just take a step back. And I think a lot of times um, we respond in emotion. And so, you know, if, if something is not happening the way we want it to, we may react versus respond. And, um, and that just heightens everyone's level of 
um, emotionality. So it's really kind of important to take that into consideration and learn how, despite being together all the time, how, how do we do that? How do we make that work? Okay, next slide. Okay, so I've been talking a little bit about this, but increased isolation can lead to mental health issues. So um, that is really important to kind of keep in mind of what that may look like for you, for your service member, for your children. Um, and one of the things to consider is to keep the lines of communication open. Um, you know, you have had a lot of separation time. And so, you know, you might have been talking regularly, but I mean, how much can you talk about the normal things day to day before it becomes, you know, rut routine and you just want them to come home. And so there wasn't a, maybe a whole lot of um, in-depth connection or um, intimate conversations. And so now that you're home, it kind of takes a little bit of time to get back into not just going over the check boxes and see how things are, but really kind of see how, how the other's doing. Um, and, you know, when we are having issues ourselves or struggling, it's sometimes hard to be open and, and, and talk to another person or talk to your service member about what really is going on. And so sometimes defensiveness can come up and you can shut down. So it's really important to keep those lines of communication open um, to prevent that from happening. Um, and it's going to take some time. Um, but, you know, it, it will happen if you do it little by little. So there's been probably a lot of quantity time, a lot of time spending together, but not necessarily quality time. So, you know, figure out what that will look like for, for you as your, fa for your family, for you as a couple. Um, then again, there may be some, um, parents on here that have, um, single soldiers as well. So I don't want to disclude that. Um, but technology takes up so much of our, our time and, um, you know, what we do for fun. So, you know, pull out those board games that have been sitting there, you know, maybe a couple times a week as a family and um, just do, you know, fun things like that. Um, puzzles, you know, just the things that don't require technology and just maybe as a, as a couple or as a family discuss, you know, what you want for the future. Um, you know, because this is going to look different for every family. Um, and with, with COVID, it's kind of shifted something. Sometimes you've had to make a whole career change or, you know, um, different things like that. You know, school has been a issue possibly, but just think, okay, what do I want? What do we want our future to look like now that I'm home now that I can kind of reset, um, you know, Maybe we do, we don't do this non technology thing very often, but maybe we do it once a week. And um, you know, for kids, time is really important, and it's not just quantity time. Even if you spend fifteen minutes with with your child doing whatever they want to do, you know, even if it's silly to you, um, that goes a long way because they're feeling heard, they're feeling valued, and you know, they have your attention. And so if you can do that with each of your children, it would be optimal to do it once a day, but um, 15 minutes a day, it really will go a long way to reconnect. And it doesn't take a whole lot, you know? It just, they want to feel like they're, you're interested in them and it's gonna take them a while to reconnect with you, but that's one of the ways to, to do that. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so what are the warning signs and how do you know it's time to take action to, you know, when things have kind of got out of hand? Um, I can say that working in IBHS over the last month, um, we have had an increase in alcohol, um, calls regarding alcohol, people wanting to get help because of their increased use of alcohol. And, you know, even it becoming a habit over the COVID um, quarantine and, you know, just to, to cope, um, we've seen a lot of increased drinking and, and isolation. So that, that's one thing to kind of keep in mind, you know, is your, are you or your service member drinking more, um, isolating more, spending time 
you know, alone, um, uh, just, you know, not having interest in the things that they used to do before they came, before they came back or before they deployed, you know, maybe they, um, they had certain hobbies or they went out and rode motorcycles or they ran and now they're just kind of sitting at home and just not really interested in a whole lot. Um, and social isolation when opportunity is available. And I think that in this pandemic, we, it's become more of a habit. Like we can go out, but we've just gotten used to being at home. So um, when that is becoming more of a norm, that that's something to um, to keep in mind because this this is going to end <laughs> eventually. And um, getting out and doing things out in the community is is gonna we're social beings. So just kind of keep in mind, are those things happening? And is your service member um, making statements of hopelessness? Just they don't really care anymore. What's the point? Or, you know, you know, I don't really know what this future is going to look like. And just and that's not their norm. You know, they're usually positive and have goals. Um, those are some things to look at. Um, so even when they are home, uh, is your service member not connecting with your family, not connecting with your children, not connecting with you? Um, if you're doing normal, regular activities, they're just kind of sitting aside, they're on their phone, or they're just very quiet, and they're just not engaging. That's that's something to kind of keep in mind, that that might be um, a warning sign that something's going on. Um, and financial stress. So that, I mean, can cause a lot of... Um, stress with someone in their mental health. Um, so, you know, there are resources that I'm, I'm sure you've been briefed on that can help with finances. And I'm going to go into our resources, but I'd be interested in a minute. But that that's something to keep in mind. And, you know, unemployment or problems at work, those, those things can lead to a mental health crisis. So, again, there are resources um, to help with that. And if there are problems at work, oftentimes it is because of the stress, because of not being able to handle your daily um, headspace or things that have been going on and just compiling. So again, I'll talk about resources in a minute, but those are some warning signs and to kind of know, okay, maybe I need to look at this. Maybe I need to get some, talk to someone about this and see what I can do next. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what can you do to help your service member or yourself? Um, active, we always want to utilize our natural supports. Um, people that have been there for you in the past, you know, whether that's your church family or your community, neighborhood, or um, maybe it's people from work, maybe it's people from school, your friends, you know, people who have always been there for you. Um, that's kind of a first go to because you might not feel comfortable asking for mental health help, but you know, reaching out to those who you've trusted in the past is a good first step. So, you know, utilizing North Carolina National Guard resources um, that you've, I'm sure, you know, been briefed on what's available during this yellow ribbon event. Um, so, you know, helping your service member find meaning in what their new normal is or what your new normal is. You know, um, it's going to look different. A lot of people have made career changes and life changes and, you know, moved houses and just made a lot of different things because this pandemic has made us look at what's important here. Um, and so kind of finding meaning in what this new normal will look like is helpful. And ask for help if needed. So, what I like to say is one person doesn't need to know everything. They don't need to have all the answers. And sometimes you feel like you might need to have all the answers. Um, but you need to know where to go to. Um, don't don't pretend to know all that because that's a big burden to put on yourself. Um, and it's unrealistic. Um, so just know, OK, I know that I can go to family programs for this. Or I know I can go to my pastor for this. Or I know I can go to whoever it might be for whatever resource it is. And IBHS is a good resource. I'm going to talk in a minute about that. So you just need to know who to call. 
and that's really it. Um, you want them to come to you, um, but you don't have to know everything, so don't put that expectation on yourself. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is um, a graphic on the North Carolina National Guard Integrated Behavioral Health System, and we're broken apart by state, as you can see. We have um, we have a therapist in Asheville. We have um, a therapist in Charlotte. We have um, a therapist in High Point. I myself are in Wilmington. We have Fayetteville, and we're um, we have someone in Raleigh that we're um, looking to hire, but that's vacant right now. So many of you may be familiar with what IBHS is, but we have been around since 2010. And um, what we do is we have 24 seven availability. So that means at any time of the day or night, any day of the year, you can call and you can get consultation on what's going on with yourself or your family member. It doesn't have to be a crisis. Um, you know, we prefer you call before it's a crisis, but um, you're going to get the right level of care by credentialed licensed therapists who've been doing this a very long time. And we'll know that one number, okay, where do I need to go for this? So, and we're going to get you the right level of care the first time. So it is confidential. And so, you know, a lot of times our service members are hesitant to call and get help. They're afraid that this is going to ruin their career. Um, but, you know, it, it's confidential except for harm to self or harm to others. So um, it, it's kind of like a lifeline because sometimes if you don't know where to call, you know, we're going to direct you to the right place. Um, we're going to do a, you know, a thorough assessment on what's going on and see what the resources that you might be um, needing to help you get through this, this situation. So we also do treatment, evidence-based treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression. Um, and, you know, we are understanding of what the guard culture is. We are embedded in all of the armories that are throughout the state that this map shows. And that is a way for us to kind of um, become part of a family, you know, so that we are known, we're not outsiders. Um, and, you know, we are familiar with what the different and unique struggles National Guard families and service members deal with versus active duty. Um, and we have wellness advocates. Um, so we don't just deal with the talk therapy or, you know, dealing with the behavioral health issues. We often know that your finances might lead to that, or maybe you're getting ready to have to get out of your house at the end of the month or maybe you don't have enough food to get you through the month or diapers or you know school supplies or things like that can you know increase your stressors to lead to a mental health crisis so our wellness advocates are very versed in what community resources are available how to access both the internal guard resources and the community resources and so you know sometimes people call just for that they don't have a behavioral health crisis but they are very stressed out and so that's one of the things that we can assist with. Uh, we do do crisis intervention. We've, we've been doing that a lot lately. It seems like, um, I think because people are maybe hesitant to seek help when things are starting to become a problem, um, it ends up being a crisis um, because it's just built up and built up. But that is one of the things we do. We answer calls three in the morning. Um, whatever it might be to, to help reduce that and get that service member, family member, what they need. Um, and like I said, we, there's a lot of resources out there and I'm sure you've heard from a lot of them. Um, but you know, you might not know who to call and when to call. So when you call us, we're going to get you the accurate assessment of what's going on and get you where you need to be, whether that's with us or another resource that, um, you know, you've been briefed on or that are in the community. Um, and so we also go out to the units and um, unfortunately we've had a lot of suicides this past year and we talk with the units about um, how to deal with that and, and our presence there. So those are some of the things that um, that we do. We are a free service and North Carolina is very lucky. It's one of the only states that 
has this available to them have you know six therapists three case managers um 24 7 access um, most states have one maybe two people covering the whole state so it is a resource that's available to you for your service member for yourself as a family member so please access it if you need to um okay um next slide please okay so this is our used to be called an egg so it it just has the arrows going in and out and that shows that we refer out to all the guard resources that are listed here you know education we utilize a lot employment um we you know get referrals from them they get referrals from us family programs the same thing and you know legal um we work in conjunction with these guard resources um, to get the service member and the family member what they need so you know sometimes someone might call family programs for some assistance and then they might call us and say hey we need you need your help with this can you help so um, it's a fluid uh, relationship um, and you know we also refer out to external agencies the VA the vet center different things like that um, and it's um, it's worked so you know I think IBHS is a good place to start if you don't know where to go. Um, and this may be your first deployment, this may be your um, third, but each deployment's different. And um, with this COVID environment, it, it just adds on the stress. Um, and so I just encourage you if there are some things going on, uh, to seek out some assistance. Um, you, your service member's been back a little bit. You kind of know maybe what the issues are and tried to handle them on your own possibly, but you've been given a, a slew of resources on this Yellow Ribbon event. I would just encourage you to utilize, um, utilize what you need and there's no shame in it. I mean, we've had people who have been financially stable and everything like that up until this point and, and needed help. And that's okay. So that's what we're here for. Um, I appreciate all that you do. And um, I think that's my last slide. So uh, that's all I have. But if you don't see it on here, the number we, that you can call is 855-322-3848. And I would encourage you to put this in your phone because sometimes um, you might not have this resource, you know, this slide or whatever but you most likely have your phone available. So you can always pull that up. It's on the Guard website as well, but just so you have easy access to it. So thank you so much for your time.